Okay, seeing that we have a quorum of the town council um, members present, I call the, for the meeting of the town council to order at 6.30. Uh, while we originally had one councilor requesting to attend via remote participation because of the snow in Boston, she is with us tonight instead. So we will not have remote participation. Um, we're, I'm going to go over a few announcements and then describe some changes in the order of our agenda. Um, first of all, the uh, statement of interest to the Municipal School Building Authority. Many of you have been participating in the listening sessions. There have been four. I will say that counselor attendance at those listening sessions has been outstanding, and I wanna thank you all for the efforts you've made to be there. Uh, there are two more, one on Wednesday, March 6th, from 4 to 6 at Crocker Farm Elementary School, and Wednesday, March 6th, 7 to 9 at Amherst Regional High School. Uh, we also then invite any and all of you to join us for the public forum on the proposed town budget, which is on Thursday, March 7th at 6.30 at Amherst Regional Middle School. And before we go on to the next item, I just want to mention it's been a very busy weekend in Amherst. <laughs> we uh, had excellent support from our police and fire departments, as well as those of cooperating towns and the Massachusetts State Police. Uh, they all made a significant contribution to the coordinated response, ensuring the safety of all of our residents during the cel celebratory events of our students. Uh, but at the same time, we uh, recognize the rapid and thorough response of our DPW and especially the water department to the un unexpected loss of wat water resulting in the loss of water pressure. The water is safe to drink, but we continue to ask you to be conservative in your use while we wait the changes that have to be made in the repairs. Mr. Bachelman has requested that I recognize him so that he can introduce the members of the Resident Advisory Committee. Um, thank you, um, President Griesmer. Uh, we have two of our three members of the Resident Advisory Committee um, who are here tonight that I wanted to ask them to come up and so you can see them. Um, and there are f two familiar faces and one new face and our, unfortunately our uh, third person isn't able to be here tonight because she's working. Um, sometimes people have different work hours. So the person who isn't here, unfortunately, is Keisha Dennis. Um, and uh, Ms. Dennis came here as a uh, student and then stayed and continued um, living in town, and has had children, has, has been working in the town, um, has not been involved in town government before, and uh, unlike our two experienced people here, and, uh, but has had a lot of experience with uh, nonprofits. Also, we have uh, Connie Kruger, who everybody knows was a former member of the select board, extensive experience in town government, including an employee, then as a member of the town meeting, select board, board of assessors, planning board, downtown parking working group, and she was the governor's appointee to the uh, Amherst Housing Authority. And Jim Pistrang, who is the, everybody knows, our former town, town moderator, um, he's also served in multiple capacities in town government, including uh, as a town meeting member, um, town manager search committee, the dog park task force, the town meeting electronic voting committee, and the Puffers Pond 2020 committee. And I really appreciate all three of these um, people for uh, stepping up, being willing to participate and serve on the residents advisory committee. Um, as you know, the residents advisory committee doesn't have a lot of um, form <laughs> to it uh, in the charter. So I'm really gonna be depending on these people to help develop what this committee's role is and what they, um, and how best we, the town manager in the future and current can use the um, residence advisory committee to help uh, ensure that the best people and the most diverse group of people are appointed uh, during the appointment process. So I thank you for taking them out of order. Uh, uh, one of our members has a, an important uh, thing to take care of, so. Would either of you like to make a comment? <laughs> you know, like it's, it's good to be here, you know, it's. Hi everybody, 
Um, Jim and I were just saying in the back of the room, it's our first council meeting, so I'm really pleased to be here, and um, I'm honored to be invited to be part of the Resident Advisory Committee. Um, it's a little free form, as many things are as we're inventing, but i um, hoping that uh, my experience and thoughts and whatever knowledge of the community can be helpful to the manager and to the town, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it unfolds. Okay. I'll say something too. Um, thanks to the town manager for uh, appointing me. I'm looking forward to working with him and looking forward to the other committee members, and I'm committed to reaching out and getting a diverse selection of our town and an inclusionary selection of our town involved in the town. So this is a great platform to be working to do that. We want to thank both of you and our, your missing member and uh, look forward to uh, fi seeing how you figure it out, <laughs> okay? So you may have noticed the agenda has had some revisions and I'm just gonna ask both the audience, the people at home and especially the counselors to just hang with me because we had no fewer than nine of 11 items changed today at different points. So it's been a little bit of a who's on first. Um, so first of all, we are going to take proclamations and commemorations commemorations out of order and do those first since there are a number of people in the audience who are here for that purpose. Uh, then we will follow with public comment. And after that, uh, you may have noticed that we were planning tonight to have the Town Meeting Advisory Committee present their proposal, and they have asked for a delay in that. We have agreed to that delay to a future meeting yet to be determined. But I do want to mention that it already posted for the purposes of this meeting were various items, and the council did have access to the proposal provided by TMAC, but it was not posted publicly. We will do so and make sure that TMAC has plenty of time in advance of when we will be hearing that, talking with them. Um, and then finally, we are going to do one other flip, and this one, Margaret, even you don't know about, <laughs> um, and that is at the request of Doug Slaughter, we're actually going to take the uh, Board of License Commissioners first and then transportation, okay? So, the first item under proclamations and commemorations is the Tibetan Day Proclamation, and would, the, would those of you that are speaking please come forward? Please identify yourself and then proceed to okay. tell us about your proclamation. Great. Thank you. Um, good evening and um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, this is the first time as members of the Regional Tibetan Association we are coming before the town council and so we want to congratulate you and wish you the best. Uh, this is the first time I think uh, with the new form of government, so uh, we're here to request the continuation of the proclamation uh, on Tibet. Uh, my name is Thondup Sering. I'm the president of the Regional Tibetan Association. And my name is Nima Dalma. I am the vice president of the Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts. And I am Sotram Kunsang, and I'm the secretary of the uh, Tibetan Association of Massachusetts. So on March 10th, 2019, Tibetans throughout the world will gather to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising against the brutal occupation of Tibet and to pay tribute to more than one million, million Tibetans who have died in their struggle for freedom of Tibet. The Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts Amherst will hold a flag raising ceremony and a walk for Tibet from Amherst to Northampton to mark this important anniversary. 60 years ago, on this fateful day, when the Tibetan people for the first time learned, learned about the Chinese army's plan to abduct His Holiness the Dalai Lama, over 100,000 Tibetans surrounded his summer palace 
to prevent the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's abduction. Tension began to build up, and on March 17, 1959, His Holiness the Dalai Lama fled Tibet and sought refuge in India. When the Chinese army learned about his escape, a full-scale attack on the capital city took place, shelling the summer palace. So during the invasion, over 1.2 million Tibetans lost their life, and 98% of Buddhist monasteries, which were the centers of Tibetan culture and learning, were systematically destroyed. This year also marks the 11th anniversary of the 2008 series of large-scale peaceful protests campaign throughout Tibet, which were ruthlessly suppressed by Chinese forces. According to the US Department of State, the government of People's Republic of China is engaged in the severe repression of Tibet's unique religious, culture, and linguistic heritage, and is engaged in gross violation of human rights in Tibet, including extrajudicial detention, disappearances, and torture. According to the 2018 Freedom House report, Tibet is the second least free country in the world, next only to Syria. To all freedom-loving people in the world, we ask you to stand on the side of the history. Lend your voice to end genocide in Tibet and support the Tibetan people's move movement for the right to live in their own country free of oppression and discrimination, to peacefully resolve the issue of Tibet and to bring about stability and coexistence between the Tibetan and Chinese people. Based on equality and mutual cooperation, His Holiness the Dalai Lama proposed the middle way approach, which was adopted democratically by the Central Tibetan Administration and the Tibetan people. On behalf of the members of the Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts, I would like to invite members of the town council to join us either for the flag raising ceremony in Amherst or the walk from Amherst to Northampton. Thank you, and I yield my time to Nima Doma. And I would like to highlight on the successful passage of the Reciprocal Access uh, to Tibet Act passed into law uh, last year on December 19th. Uh, this bill was introduced and sponsored by our Congressman Jim McGovern. Uh, this really sends a direct message to the Chinese officials of their unfair and discriminatory uh, policies against uh, all Americans, diplomats, um, journalists, and Tibetan Americans, especially traveling to Tibet, but have no uh, equal access. Uh, whereas the Chinese citizens who come to the United States they travel across throughout the country freely, freely without any restrictions. So we are looking forward to your continued support in making sure now this bill that has come into law is being uh, implemented and holding China accountable for its actions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just want to like, you know, um, yeah, do my uh, thank you note. On behalf of the uh, Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts, I would like to extend my gratitude to the members of the town council for giving us the opportunity to come to this meeting today. Um, I also want to thank you for the favorable consideration to declare and observe Tibet Day on March 10 in solidarity of Tibetans all over the world, including a flag raising uh, ceremony here. Um, I also want to thank the town for other arrangements, including the sound systems to be used um, on that day. Thank you again. Okay. Uh, does the council have any questions at this time? If not, um, I'd like to hear a motion to adopt the Tibet Day 2019 proclamation. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Alyssa, I didn't see your hand. Thank you. It's quite minor, and luckily, since only one person signs now on our behalf, mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about perfecting it before we all sign it. But um, it just it has Wat for Tibet bolded, and there's no reason for that. So if we could just fix that before you sign it, okay. that's helpful. And I, for those fellow town councilors that are unfamiliar with this, we have been doing this for several years at the select board level, and we appreciate people bringing this forward as part of our Tibetan community. So thank you. We also really appreciated the uh, wonderful ceremony you had to honor Jim McGovern for his work on your behalf. 
That was very nice. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? All right. Do I hear a motion to adopt the Tibet Day 2019 proclamation as presented? Pat is the uh, motion and the second. Dorothy? Yes, second. Any further comment? All those in favor, please raise your right hand or left hand. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. I think that was unanimous. I'm an abstain. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one abstention. Were there any no's? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And for counselors who would like to join me, uh, the ceremony is at 10 o'clock on the steps of Town Hall this coming Sunday. And as we did in a previous event, I would ask that you join me where each of us read a piece of the proclamation. Okay. Uh, the next is the resolution in support of changing the Massachusetts state flag and seal. Who is here to speak on behalf of that? Please come forward. Please, please sit down, identify yourself, and speak to the motion, or speak to the um, resolution. Uh, my name is Elaine Kemseth. I have lived in Amherst for 17 years. Thank you. My name is Elaine Kenseth. I've lived in Amherst for 73 years, since I was four. Um, I would urge the town council to join other towns sure. in Western Massachusetts in support of changing the Massachusetts and state flag and seal. Um, I never paid attention to the flag and I never paid attention to the seal, but it's, it has been sponsored, the uh, resolution has been come up in the uh, state legislature for many, many years by uh, Byron Rushing, who is not in the legislature anymore. But we have to thank Joe Comerford, our state senator, for uh, raising this resolution in the state senate. And also, let's see, Lindsay Sabasa from Northampton, who is the, uh, who's leading this in the House. So Western Mass is well represented. I believe that Hadley also supported this resolution. What's uh, out, to me outrageous as I learned about this, uh, the seal and the flag, is that uh, the motto for our, our state is, by the sword we seek peace. I think that a lot of things that have happened in Massachusetts would, would uh, we would deserve to have a better motto than something like that because we have many other kinds of uh, initiatives that are not by the sword, that we seek peace otherwise, and we deserve to be represented well by what's on our state seal and flag. Um, the the uh, native person is not representative of the Wampanoag tribes or the New England tribes from uh, Chippewa, which is further west from here. Uh, and the sword over the head of a native person is itself, to me, quite outrageous. It's a, a uh, reproduction of the uh, Miles Standish sword, and it's just the, the whole uh, picture. I think we deserve better, and I'm, just, I'm taking that from my heart. I'm not a politician. I, I advocate for a lot of things in town. Um, we work mostly with refugees and with um, other peoples who are marginalized, and um, I, I just think we can do better. And I, I know Hadley has voted, and I think Orange last year voted for this resolution, and uh, it would be really wonderful if the state legislature, uh, the state senate, could hear from the people of this, this town and the towns around to make a major change. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from the council? Mandy Jo. I just had a housekeeping. The last, be it further resolved, has a spelling error. So if that could just be corrected, assuming this passes, you know, before it's signed. 
resolved. In resolved. Mm -hmm. Any other qu comments or questions? Yes, Alyssa. So resolutions are, and proclamations are always super interesting. Because of my experience, of course, I'm comfortable with the ones I've done before. So I'm comfortable with Black History Month. I'm comfortable with Tibet Day, et cetera. But we've often run into ones where we personally may feel very strongly about a particular issue, but we don't feel like we've necessarily heard about it from a number of people in our community. And so it's a little unclear sometimes whether it's necessary to have it be a town council action, just as we usually we used to discuss at the town meeting level, or is it necessarily to have it be a town meeting action versus a nice to do versus encouraging hundreds of our friends and neighbors to write their own separate letters into the legislature because sometimes the legislature has said, you know, what they really want is a stack of emails or a stack of letters from individuals rather than from a council. So I'd like to hear from my fellow counselors if we just feel strongly enough about this as individuals, which I certainly am, am not disagreeing with anything that's been said here, or if, if we think it's necessary to do this, appropriate to do this as a council. Comments or questions? Aunt Pat. Um, I feel strongly that we need to do this. Um, I feel that white America has to take responsibility for um, what we've done and how we've created this country. Um, and I think we need to really take honest and deep looks at ourselves. And this is one way of doing that. And that's saying it is no longer acceptable to use images of genocide and, uh, as our flag. Um, yeah. Other comments? Dorsey. I would agree with Pat that um, this, is, this is definitely an appropriate thing for the town council to make a statement on. And we saw in our packet that there are a number of other local communities that have done the same thing. Our, our um, um, state rep and our state senator have um, supported this bill. And um, it seems like a um, fantastic thing very positive thing for the town council to do at this time. Other questions or comments? Yes, George. Serving 12 years in town meeting, um, these sorts of uh, resolutions and, that were presented were always a challenge for me because um, often I was being basically asked for my own personal opinion. And uh, no one in my, well, actually one person in my district has actually spoken to me about this, and that's because I announced it at the district meeting and asked people if they had any opinion. There were 70 people present. This one person came up and spoke to me briefly. Um, I'm uncomfortable voting for something like this because I haven't heard from my constituents, and I suppose I'm supposed to represent them. So I'm going to abstain. I'm not going to vote against it. Um, the sentiment I have some sympathy for, um, some of the history here uh, that's in the whereases, I have a lot of issues with, but the basic sentiment I agree with. But as an individual, uh, I have my own views, but as a counselor, I feel like I'm supposed to represent my constituents. And uh, I haven't heard from them really at all. So in this case, I'm going to abstain. Other comments? I know. Other comments from council? I have a question. Yes, Dorothy. Um, this resolution says that if it's passed, that uh, a committee of Massachusetts legislators will sit down with um, some native people, native leaders from Massachusetts and design a new flag. Does that flag then come back to us to okay? I don't know that we have an answer to that question. Certainly, we're. Thank you very much. My name is David Dutmold. I'm from Montague, where I've served on town meeting now since 2006. Um, and to answer the councillor's question through the chair, um, the resolution would support the passage of the bills uh, that are in the House and Senate, sponsored by Joe Comerford in the Senate and Lindsay Sabadosa in the House. If those bills pass, uh, a special commission would be established to include five legislators, uh, 
five, um, we call them native leaders, because they certainly will be leaders who uh, will be representing the various native nations of the Commonwealth, certainly. Uh, some of which are state recognized, some of which are federally recognized, and some of them, like the Massachusetts tribe themselves, whose name we have appropriated, um, are neither federal nor state recognized nations, yet they are very much among the, the people who now live in the Commonwealth, and they would also, we hope, have a seat on that commission, which would be chaired by the uh, Commissioner on Indian Affairs, and which would include no less than three uh, statewide arts organization representatives, a representative of the State Historic Commission, a representative of the Secretary of State who holds the seal, and two uh, unaffiliated individuals who will be chosen by the governor. It will be the special commission's task to come up with the new design, um, but it will change. If the, uh, the current flag, which it might be illustrative if the council would allow just to take a look at the flag, which is just to your immediate uh, left, Madam Chair, um, to see what exactly the image is we're talking about. But that image will change if the, if the, two bill, if the bill passes. And what we are asking the council to do tonight, as in Northampton on Thursday, and Greenfield is about to schedule a hearing as well, uh, is to support that effort as your uh, senator and representative have already done. So uh, the design work would be left to the special commission. The heavy lifting will be left to the legislature. But it is, I think, every town's right uh, to say this particular flag, which sits on our stage furled, and which sits on the stage of every elementary school and high school in the Commonwealth, where our third graders uh, study the state flags and images uh, in third grade as part of the core curriculum, thereby receiving this image of violence between the white hand holding the sword above the head of the native man, okay? That's n not necessarily something that we wish to continue uh, perpetrating on our very, very young children. It's not just harmful to native children. It's harmful to all children to absorb these images of white supremacy. Uh, it is really only Massachusetts and Mississippi where this debate continues. Mississippi with the stars and bars, Massachusetts with the colonial broadsword over the native man. So we hear your concerns that you haven't heard from your constituents and we would welcome, speaking for myself, and I'm not a member of your, t your town, I'm not a resident of your town, but those of us who are working on this statewide effort would welcome a public hearing if you wish to go that route where we could invite all your residents of all backgrounds to come make comment and perhaps to take a look at the flag for the first time. It is stamped on the front cover of every voter guide that goes out for every referendum, every election. It is stamped on the side doors and, uh, of every state patrol car. And it is uh, on every piece of stationery. So it's subtle in some ways. You might not recognize it at first, but if you take a look at it, it's nakedly clear what it represents. And I did the research uh, in the state archives and the special collections room, and I can stand by every comment uh, in the whereas clauses. I can give you the documentation for it. Thank you. Are there other comments by the council? Then I think at this point we, I would, entertain a motion to adopt the resolution in support of changing the Commonwealth flag and seal of Massachusetts as presented. Is there a, a person making that motion? Dorothy, a second? Shalini, any further conversation? Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, abstained. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on to the resolution in support of First Congregational Church of Amherst, in Amherst, United Church of Christ, continuing to serve as a temporary shelter. And I'm calling on Reverend Vicki Kemper. Good evening. 
It is an honor to sit before you all for the first time. And with me here, I've, there are two other church members and church officers. Mary Lou Sullivan, I'm the moderator of the church. My name is Ralph Falkingham. I'm one of the church trustees. Okay. So as most of you know, I think Lucio Perez has been in sanctuary at First Church Amherst since October 2017. Uh, you may not realize that since before that time, before Lucio actually came and took residence in the church, we have been in consultation with town officials, uh, the building commissioner, the fire chief, the health department, uh, even the police chief, to make sure that we were going through the proper procedures and providing a safe space for Mr. Perez to be in our church. And the way the state building codes work, uh, we have also had to go before the state building code appeals board. We did that for the first time last January. They granted us a nine month variance as a temporary shelter. When we went back to them last July, they told us that we were no longer a temporary shelter, that we were a permanent shelter, and therefore we would have to make uh, significant renovations to our building to meet code that is required for permanent shelter. And so we have responded to them and will be going before the board again this Thursday. We are requesting a continuation of the original variance they gave us for another nine months because we have no intention of becoming a permanent shelter for Mr. Perez. His home is in Springfield with his family, and as soon as he is able to safely return to them, he will do that. And it is very important to us to continue to be safe uh, and to meet any building code and health inspections that are required to, of us, but we would prefer not to spend $75,000 to qualify as a permanent shelter that we don't want to be. And that's the long and short of it. Okay. Any other comments from the other people? Okay. Questions or comments from the council? Shalini? So are there any concerns uh, for the coming nine months or so to uh, safeguard this person's safety or health or um, does, does anything need to be done to, you know, to maintain the conditions that are being required? So when we originally went before the State Building Code Appeals Board and were supported by town officials of Amherst in our request for a variance, we were granted that variance, and so we understood that to mean that they understood that we had provided safe conditions for Mr. Perez to live there temporarily. And now those conditions have not changed, and yet because there's a higher bar for temporary shelters, they're wanting us to make uh, significant renovations, for example, providing uh, a, a private bathroom with a handicapped accessible shower, uh, providing some, tearing down some walls and providing further fire prevention protection. And again, the, the actual safety of the residents of the, the room he's living in has not changed at all. It's just their classification of the shelter. Are there other questions? Yes, Andy Joe. What was the variance that you were granted and are continuing to seek? Uh, we're, we requested a variance to operate as a temporary shelter, and that's the variance we're continuing to seek. We're seeking it for nine additional months. This is what we requested last July, and we're denied that request, and we're given until a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago to submit plans to meet their requirements as a permanent shelter. We are also arguing before the board that we believe that our provision of sanctuary to Mr. Perez is part of our constitutionally protected 
freedom of religion because it is part of our religious mission. Alyssa. So I wonder if we, through you, um, Lynn, we could ask the town manager if staff has in fact expressed any concerns about continuing to do this because as far as we've been presented, we, it's only been one individual just as it had been originally. I understand the state likes to turn temporary into permanent, but this is not as I, as I have been familiar with it in the past and as also with our, our seasonal shelter is that always has to get variances of various kinds too. And we are not attempting to provide shelter for numerous people at numerous stages of sanctuary. We are just trying to do one thing again. But I know it says here, conditional on the approval of the Town of Amherst authorities, but I just wanted to check in to see if okay. there had been any concerns expressed. Mr. Bauckham. Uh, thank you. So when this first came up, the building commissioner actually went to Boston and testified in favor of this. Um, from the town's point of view, this is not health or safety issue. They, the church has um, accommodated every request that the town has made from the health department, from the building department, and from the fire chief. And in fact, the fire chief and the building commissioner and I have all written letters to the um, appeals board recommending that they continue with the existing situation instead of changing the situation. Um, so but it really is up to them. I believe that um, we're prepared uh, to support it as much as we can because from the town's inspector's point of view, it, um, all the health and life and safety things are in, a, in compliance. Thank you. Evan? This, excuse me. This isn't a question so much as just a comment um, for the council and to better contextualize this debate but I do believe that our representative who is in the room tonight uh, has uh, sponsored legislation to uh, the Massachusetts legislature to ensure that uh, people who are seeking sanctuary in houses of worship will remain to be seen as state as temporary residents uh, with regard to building code. So uh, perhaps uh, this will be the last time that we have to do something like this. Representative Dom, would you like to speak to that? Please stand. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even put you on the spot. Well, if you didn't, I was going to. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. This is my first time in the room with the renovations, and I'm very excited to see it again. Um, and I'm really so pleased to be here to be able to listen to what's happening in this discussion and to support uh, First Church. I have introduced legislation that would, in fact, as council member Ross says, view people who are in houses of worship sinking sanctuary to avoid deportation as temporary residents for the purposes of the building code. Um, this is not only to protect the church in our community and Lucio's sanctuary in our community, but if, um, if allowed to be viewed as permanent residents and then to have the um, subsequent extremely high prohibitive expense that might in, be incurred, it could be viewed as also a disincentive to other houses of worship to provide sanctuary. And so I was moved to do this um, in speaking with um, uh, the church and also to, because of the statewide implication for this. Um, quite frankly, I think residents of sanctuary should be viewed as temporary, just as the occupant of the White House should be viewed as temporary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't speak for the church in that. I'm speaking for Thank you, Mindy. Are there other questions or comments? Yes, Andy. Yeah, just a few things. One is that. <clears throat> When the um, select board approved the um, sanctuary um, provisions that we had enacted sub after town meeting action, um, I spoke very personally and strongly about why Amherst needs to take a strong stance. And as I've told Reverend Kemper before, I've been particularly proud of having a church in our community that has put itself into this wholeheartedly as it has. Um, the only reservation that I would have at all 
is that I'm a little bit um, wary of uh, having the council urge um, the executive action on some types of subjects. But I think that this one is very appropriate. I think that the resolution is well worded and uh, so I will be pleased to vote yes. Pat. Um, I want to say that the sanctuary at First Church is supported by hundreds of people, people of faith, atheists, agnostics. It is um, gay, straight. Uh, we're, we're there because it, it's important to us to protect the people in our community. And I think you're doing an incredible job. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions? Okay, then do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution in support of the First Congregational Church in Amherst, United Church of Christ, request to maintain a temporary shelter as presented? So moved. Andy, so moved. Second. Pat. Any further questions? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much for your Thank good you work. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move to general public comment at this time. May I see a show of hands of people who would like to speak, excuse me, about an issue that is not on the agenda later and specifically agenda 5A or the transportation update. Mr. Kuzner. Is this on? Yeah, th thank you, Madam President. Uh, as I communicated to the president of the council earlier, there were a couple of items in addition to the item she just mentioned that I wanted to bring to your attention, although my comments may or may not be related to that, depending on what happens under that item. Um, I'm here at this part of the meeting to ask this legislature to act on a number of items that are effectively executive items, but that were brought to the executive by the previous legislature known as town meeting. And uh, interestingly enough, our local newspaper in an editorial this past week addressed one of them. I was surprised to see that, but one of the items that I believe is still an outstanding item is the appropriation of a modest amount of funds towards human services. And uh, I imagine many of you read the bulletin, and I hope you've seen that. And I know that there are people who uh, had worked with me on the select board years ago on this issue, uh, and also who've worked for decades on, the, on town meeting to ensure that some funding for human services remains part of the town's budget. So whether or not this legislature passes resolutions on items that are asking the executive to carry out the acts of previous legislatures, I, I, I seriously hope it will and in that matter and also in matters that will come up further tonight. I was going to make one other comment, but given that the time is short, I think I'll just hold it and look forward to talking with you a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're moving on to presentations and discussion. Mr. Bockelman, uh, you are going to introduce the Board of License Commissioners. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. So, um, as you recall, uh, the Board of License Commissioners was appointed and confirmed by the Council uh, a few weeks ago, and they have met a couple times. They've been busy at work. And I think there are three, four of us here, four of them here today. And if, I'd like just want you to make sure that you know who they are, if, if they would like to come up and sort of introduce themselves. Um, Please come forward. Doug Slaughter. Marion Walker. Paul Musgrave. Gaston de los Reyes. And I understand you've met a couple times. Mr. Bachman, further comment? Yeah, so, so <clears throat> I would like them to thank them for coming in. They got off to a quick start. Um, they elected uh, Mr. Slaughter to serve as their chair, 
and uh, I think it was important for them to, this is a, a commission that was created by the charter uh, and, to, and to take over a lot of the responsibilities that had previously been held by the select board. And so they have been busy looking at the um, tasks in front of them, doing some actual approving of one day liquor licenses and getting to know each other, in fact. So, turn Are it there comments from the members of the commission? So Doug. I have a few things. I don't know if any of my colleagues do or not. Um, just to reiterate, yes, we've met a couple of times. We've, we've uh, at present decided on the second and fourth Mondays at 2 o'clock as our meeting time. Uh, we found that interfered least or less with uh, holidays than first and third. Uh, but uh, so we've, we've got a regular meeting time. Uh, to date, we've, we've dealt with uh, short-term liquor licenses. <clears throat> um, but that's also the first form we've been reviewing. Um, there's some ideas, uh, you know, you, you get into these and look at the forms again for the first time for some of these folks, not so much for me, but, but uh, there are some things about them that, you, that beg a lot of questions. And some of which is just climbing the learning curve on what is allowed or not allowed by state law, uh, but also some of the intentions behind what, what is on uh, our particular uh, forms. For example, uh, there's a recommendation for use of paper cups, actually a requirement for use of paper cups, uh, and not bottles and cans. So it puts plastic in a bit of a no man's land. So some of those kinds of things we are sort of rediscovering and looking back at policy, uh, if it exists, uh, certainly getting familiar with and re reviewing uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, state law. Um, but there are other areas besides just liquor that we want to take an, an interest in and a view of. Uh, there's some new things in front of the legislature uh, relative to uh, short-term stay facilities, I guess is one way to phrase it. Uh, you know, an Airbnb type of facilities and what is allowable by us. Um, uh, there's some existing state law around Sunday alcohol service that we may look into a little bit. And what we'll probably do on some of those types of things will be to review those in particular, see what we think uh, meshes well or doesn't from the lens of the Board of License Commissioner write a memo to you guys to, to take under consideration because oftentimes it would require action by the, by the council. Um, so there's a few of those kind of things we're going to start. Fortunately, we're not in the renewal season. It happens later in the year, so we have the opportunity to sort of deal with those things that are most immediate to us, which are the short-term licenses, uh, and then we'll work our way through other licenses and, and review the forms that we have uh, the intention behind them and, and, uh, and make sure that we create a clear and coherent picture for both the, uh, the applicants and for the public at large and, and try to preserve and protect the, the, uh, the safety and, and uh, use by both public at large and give our businesses a clear you know, opportunity to perform what service they want to perform. Other members? Sure, hi. Um, it's a pleasure to join a new commission with a fresh mandate. Uh, right away, we got to licenses that needed a, attending to, and so in some ways we got right into work, and I look forward to having the chance as a commission and also with feedback from the town council to think about the policy questions that go into the engagement between uh, people in town requesting licenses and when and when they shouldn't be approved and other ways that we can enhance the uh, business and community environment in, in Amherst. Okay. Um. I just wanted to say it's uh, been a, an exciting couple of meetings. I've been learning a lot. Um, it's also been great to work with uh, the fellow commission members and with Mr. Bockelman. I also wanted to acknowledge the staff, uh, Rob Morrow, the Bishing, uh, building commissioner, and um, Jennifer Moyston and Stephen McCarthy. It's been excellent. We've received excellent support from them. Thank you. I'll just add to what's been said by saying it's been interesting work. Um, our first few meetings, I'm not sure to call them exciting. I think that will happen when <laughs> dispensaries or renewals or new licenses come up. There will be plenty of excitement for everybody. Are there questions from the council? Andy. Yeah, I guess uh, this won't surprise uh, Mr. Slaughter when I bring up the topic, but um, one of the things that happened with the select board when it was the licensing body was that um, through two of our members being um, part of the campus and community coalition to address problems of high risk drinking, which is a cooperative arrangement between us and the university. Um, it sensitized um, two of the five to a serious problem and gave us a linkage to the people at the university who've been working very hard on that subject. 
And um, I don't know if you've given any consideration to uh, whether you want to or think it appropriate to have a linkage to the um, Campus and Community Coalition, but um, I just did want to um, sort of acknowledge the importance that I felt that we had to that linkage in the sensitization that it gave to us. If I may. Um, it's ironic you bring this up because literally um, last week at our, after our meeting, it was the manager swung by to see how the meeting went and, and it had crossed my mind the day before exactly that, whether or not um, a member of the License Commission should or shouldn't potentially serve as, as a liaison to the Campus and Community Coalition. I have not yet brought that up to my colleagues and we'll probably put it on this week's agenda. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think that it's important that one or more, maybe more of the counselors also serve in that role, but I think it would be beneficial to have someone from our, our uh, commission on that uh, because we do deal in the more integrity day-to-day -day functional sort of aspects. And, and there are things we can put in and communicate to those who seek licenses or uh, that sort of thing that can be helpful to the, to the whole process, I think. So um, it has crossed our mind and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to participate. Okay, other questions, Dorothy? Will you, this commission is, I can't tell if this is an, okay. Will this commission deal with uh, marijuana licenses? Well, <laughs> perhaps. Um, I think that's one of those topics that we have to bring up, uh, you know, as to whether we should have a local license for, uh, for marijuana. Um, what that should look like, that would then probably come back to you guys in the form of a memo. It's like, here's what we think. We've thought about this a lot. Uh, that is definitely, you know, a, an area uh, that we'll definitely have to take up in some form or another and then make a recommendation to the council as to what, what we think would be a good idea for the town to do. Um, you know, sort of quick back the envelope would be, yeah, I think it's a smart idea. But there's a lot of things that have to be considered. So that's a personal opinion, by the way. Out of order. Other questions? Yes. So I'm as new as you guys are, so forgive me if this is an obvious question, but uh, is, there a web, uh, is there a process on the website for people to just go and know, you know, if they're starting a business, like these are the licenses, that this is the process we need to follow? I would say there is to some extent. I think we'll probably rework that pretty considerably over the next uh, few months because that'll be part of what we do because it's shifting because before it was, oh, you apply to the select board for this or that. or the, So as those things change and reshape relative to our function and relative to those things that go directly to the manager or whatever, we'll, we'll sort those out and, and obviously keep the, the website up to date as we, as we work through that. So I think that that was a long-winded way of saying yes. <laughs> Alyssa. So speaking, speaking as a former license commissioner who has a lot of opinions about how the license commission worked and how it didn't and how it should work in the future, which I really appreciate Doug being willing to still take my calls associated with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so now you're on the spot. Now you really have to, or I'll squeal to them that you haven't. So one of the things that is going to be interesting as this unfolds is that you notice how carefully he phrased, we would discuss it a lot and send you a memo, but it may or may not be something we actually get to decide about as a town council. So there are some things we may get to decide about, and I would argue that most things we will not. And so it may be something that if a particular area is of particular interest to you to follow what they're doing on their web pages. And when it comes to, for example, one of the things that I fought really hard for during the whole marijuana legislation situation was to have the possibility of a local licensing process, it's completely separate from what happens with inspections and CBA. I didn't know what it would look like, but I wanted to make sure we would have the option. So we have the option legally, we just don't know what it looks like yet, but it will be up to them, it will not be up to this body. And I really appreciated something that was said earlier by the License Commission associated and in fact phrased better than I'm going to, about the one of the things that the select board did as the elected at large body is we tried to balance safety and economic development. And in fact, the ABCC makes it really hard to say no to anybody. I mean, even if you think, I don't know if these people know what they're doing, um, it's actually pretty hard to say no there. You can actually get rejected 
for saying no by the ABCC. You cannot, for example, say that liquor store would be too close to that liquor store. It would hurt the liquor store that we've all loved going to for 30 years, so you can't have that. That's not a good enough excuse for the ABCC. So sometimes it may seem like their hands are tied, and that's because they are. <laughs> but we also appreciated that, for example, being very transparent, as Shalini pointed out, when one of the few policies we did have written down was when a license did become available because somebody gave theirs up, is to have a very transparent process so that everybody knew that one had been given up rather than it was first come, first served kind of situation. So I really appreciate that they'll be able to focus on that in a way that was separate from the select board being able to do that. And so it's lucky that the town council doesn't have to do these things. But at the same time, they're not elected to talk about economic development and safety. They're appointed to talk about that. So we'll be sending some of our constituents off to them to talk to them about those issues because they won't necessarily be coming to us or we'll be referring questions to them. So thank you very much for all you're doing to try and figure this out moving forward. Other comments or questions? Yes, Doug. I just want to add one other thing, and, and, and this gets into the sort of mechanics of the process. Uh, there are certain things that require a public hearing, capital P, capital H. Um, and like I noted earlier, we're, we're currently scheduling ourselves for the second and fourth Mondays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's not necessarily the optimum time for public input. Uh, so it's entirely likely when we go to a public hearing circumstance, we may pick a different time. Uh, if we take up particularly, uh, I don't want to say controversial necessarily, but uh, issues of high public interest, we'll probably, you know, likely try to be uh, fairly uh, transparent about that and try to have meetings uh, that are uh, opportunities for the public to come and talk to us in, in regard to, to those topics and express their opinions so we can get a, a full gathering of, of ideas uh, from people in, at different times and days. So we'll, we'll try to be cognizant of that if we're not getting that done. I certainly hope to hear from any of the counselors that feel like they're not seeing that kind of uh, participatory process because we do want to give everybody a chance, especially there's a lot of complex and, and uh, high interest things that we as a, as, as a license uh, board need to, to take under our, uh, our purview and, and to, to review both because we're new and also because there are new things that are coming out through state law. So we have to, both of those sort of coming forward uh, to us. And so we, we want to do that in a way that, that allows the community to kind of express their opinion and, and get a good sense of the community and shape our policies and, and bring things to you as, as necessary and uh, give you the, uh, the opportunity to make good decisions. Great. Um, we want to thank you all for joining us in this adventure of creating new bodies with new jobs. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, you're just going to remain. I'm going to stay. Thank you. One of the other responsibilities that Doug has continued uh, on behalf of us at the town of Amherst is that of transportation, uh, continuing to represent us with the PVTA and um, so forth. And so we've asked him to talk about the issue of transportation and particularly um, from his perspective, both regionally and within the town. Doug? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'll begin, I'll, I'll paint a little bit of a picture relative to PVTA just to sort of give you a sense of how it functions, primarily around how it acquires the money that it gets in order to uh, do the work that it does for us, and then how we fit within that structure. So the PVTA is the Regional Transit Authority, What's the, that's the TA part of PVTA. Um, separate from the MBTA, which is its own entity separate from the regional ones, uh, it is the largest of the, of the regional transit authorities. Second largest is the one in Worcester. Um, the PBTA receives money from the federal government, the state government, and from the local communities that participate within its, its area of operation. Um, and because of all of those funding sources, there are constraints placed on it about how it does some of its business. So for example, when you take federal money and you make changes to the things that you offer, uh, you have to do, uh, if you make significant changes to things, you have to make, uh, you have to have a public hearing process uh, relative to uh, major impacts, uh, dispro disproportionate impact, and disparate impact. 
the, uh, the way to think of those two is one is about a race ethnicity question, one more about an economic question. Um, and so if you have you know, changes to routes that are significant uh, or proposed changes to routes that are significant, you're required to have a public hearing process to go through that uh, and, and receive feedback from the community relative to those changes. Um, additionally, um, a large chunk of, uh, of revenue for the, for the PBTA comes from the state. And in particular, there's a, there's a line item in the budget, the governor's budget, um, and then subsequent, it, you know, he sort of sets the bar in, in January when he proposes, he in this case, because we have a male governor. But uh, when the governor sets the budget, that's, that starts a conversation. Um, the difficulty over the last couple of years relative to the governor's budget, and therefore the conversations that happened all through the spring and summer, uh, is that he, uh, the proposed funding for regional transit authorities was decided less than what had been promised in a piece of legislation from, let's say, fiscal 2014. Uh, so in that, either 14 or 15, there was a large transportation bill. It, it changed the funding to more forward funding. In other words, uh, they were going to appropriate money to be used in the fiscal year, um, which was a good thing. Um, but it also, um, that legislation promised a certain regular increase to funding for the regional transit authorities. Uh, and so the regional transit authorities went out and added service, went through a hearing process to say, well, what, what service do we need? What's, what's going to work for us? They went through a whole process to do that addition of service. Uh, they went and negotiated new contracts. Most of them have, you know, contracts like we have it in the town of about a three or four year period of time. Uh, they negotiated those contracts with their drivers for certain pay increases in their schedule of, of, of salaries. <clears throat> and for the first two years, uh, the governor uh, met the recommendations of that legislation. And in the last two years, he has not. He's held, he he's held that number steady. Now, last year, um, through the work of the legislature, uh, they appropriated an additional chunk of money, but it was contingent upon signing an agreement with the with MassDOT, with the uh, Department of Transportation. Um, and so it was contingent money. Fortunately for the PVTA, they were able to secure a fair number of funds from that, and so the, the reductions in service relative to that uh, level funding from the previous fiscal year were much, much, much less than, than had been the, uh, anticipated. And so uh, I was disappointed to find out when the, when the governor released the budget this year that he basically level funded again, which as we find out when we talk about schools and we talk about other things, if you level fund, it's essentially a cut because there are increases built in. Um, cost of fuel is different, labor costs are different, et cetera. <clears throat> All that being said, one of the other complications that the PBT runs into as it puts its budget together is that by law, we're required to have a balanced budget voted and approved by July 1. And as we know, the legislature isn't always done with the budget by July 1. Uh, so that puts them in a bind. But the other piece of the puzzle is that if, if that budget is projected to have shortfall and therefore there's a reduction in service that needs to occur that, that uh, gets into the process of evaluating whether there's a disproportionate or disparate impact uh, on the ridership, there's a public hearing process that happens. Those things take a, a fair amount of time. Because once you have those hearings, then you're required to then go back and uh, essentially employ uh, mitigating strategies. Uh, and that's part of the requirement of the federal monies uh, to do that. And so from the standpoint of you need a budget voted for July 1, uh, you have to have a hearing process that is then fully, you know, and they need to go to all the communities. So that hearing process alone takes three or four weeks to do. Uh, get feedback, process that information, potentially make alterations to the budget, and then the advisory board, which I've been sitting on the last several years, has to then has to vote that budget. They have to approve the changes to the routes and the service. Not always fixed route, we always think about that, but there's ADA ridership and all that. So it's a fairly complex process and a fairly long lead time. So the other thing that sort of plays into this is when you want to change service, particularly fixed route service, the uh, the decisions have to be made fairly early in order for the process with the drivers to, to, uh, to be, uh, I don't know how to say this, um, 
let me back up and say this differently. Um, the drivers, by virtue of their contract, based on seniority, get to pick their routes. That process happens, so the changes happen for us in our area, the northern half of the thing. Those changes happen basically at the end of August, beginning of September. The routes get picked by drivers end of July. So you have to have the routes decided by kind of the middle of July or earlier, partly so that they can print the schedules that go with, you know, the online part's easy, but the printing of actual schedules has to happen. The drivers have to bid their routes. So if I'm a driver with a lot of seniority, I get to pick my favorite routes. Somebody with less seniority doesn't pick their favorite routes. So there's these huge series of timelines that have to be met relative to budget changes. And that's a struggle that PBTA has been under over the last couple of years by virtue of uh, funding that's been either not proposed or in a contingent sort of modality, which is where it is this year as well. Um, so that's part of the difficulty you run into. And any time we propose locally to do something to change a route, some of those same sorts of pieces about disparate impact, disproportionate impact, factor in as well. Um, one of the concerns, uh, you know, town meeting, I want to say last spring, had appropriated an additional 53,000 in anticipation of trying to support the routes in that regard. One of the difficulties, and we, we spoke at length to the, to the, to the administrator of, uh, of PVTA about sort of what possibilities are there. Um, and so one of the things, and I'm, I'm going to try to find my actual email here. Um, but one of the things that they, that they wrote, and I'll just quote from an email that she wrote us, the anxiety is twofold. Concern from, from the passenger's perspective and apprehension for the political ramifications created by increasing services on some routes and not others is, is one piece. And so um, we don't want to create what, what she terms as, as false hope, and, and that is, in other words, to put service in place and then to take it back uh, a few months later is, is very deleterious to the, to the uh, building a trust with your ridership. Um, so it makes it very, very difficult, and so we have to be very conscientious of that if we offer to support additional routes. Um, so in years past, we've, we have done that. We have we've outright uh, funded routes as a town. Um, so it's possible to do that. Um, the, in that circumstance, we had a contract with the PBTA to offer that route. And so at the time, under the former government we had, and it's still true today, the town manager was able to enter into a contract and therefore guarantee a service, just like any other, like a labor contract or anything else. And so while that commits the town to certain spending, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a negotiated contract, and so it's a known amount. And, and so that is an option relative to one of the things we can do relative to providing additional support for route service in, in town. However, if we don't, do that. In other words, if we just want to offer additional funding to PVTA to support routes, um, the, the, the trepidation on their part is often around, well, will there be continuing funding in subsequent years? As a council, you can only vote a given budget. And this is part of how the PVTA is in a bind to begin with, because the legislature passed a, you know, essentially a resolution four years ago that said this would be the increase to, to funding. Subsequent legislatures cannot be bound by that. So there's no guarantee you will get that. So that's the same concern that PBTA would have relative to us taking on any additional support to them is um, can you or will you and what guarantees can you provide relative to that additional sources of funds. So if we were to enter into a contract for a specific service, that's a different circumstance than if we are trying to augment uh, uh, existing routes. And so that's, that's, you know, so things, needless to say, for all of those words, things get complicated quickly is the short story. Um, and it's not that we don't want to support, uh, you know, transportation in our community. We're very, very strong supporters of it. Um, I saw a recent proposal um, to, to augment some routes in, in and around the campus. Um, the couple of things, the 30 and the 31 were mentioned in particular, um, the questions that I would raise, not to say I like or dislike it, I haven't looked at it closely enough to answer that question or to offer any suggestion relative to that, but some of the questions are, I don't, falls in, I don't think it falls into a category of creating a problem relative to the called Title VI analysis, which is the disparate and disproportionate uh, impact. I don't think it cr crosses those thresholds. However, um, I do think we want to look at 
in the whole of transportation, uh, because that funding is coming from our transportation enterprise fund, in our whole of, looking at the whole of transportation, is this money well spent? In other words, how many, what's the ridership of that particular component of that uh, particular set of routes? Um, my understanding anecdotally from, from having conversations with the folks at UMass a few months ago, so this may not be as true today, I have not had a recent conversation with, with them, the reduction in service on the, those 30 and 31 routes were not ones they had heard a lot about relative to some others. That may have changed in the meantime. I don't want to characterize it as something other than what I, you know, what I knew. Um, so I think that the, the idea that was put forward around 30 and 31 is an interesting one. I think it's worth looking into. But I do think we should take it in context of how does this uh, fit into our whole transportation program. In other words, would our chunk of money be better spent for another bike rack of, of uh, short-term bike rental, would that be a better, higher leverage use of those dollars or not? I think those are just things to consider. Um, I will be, uh, the PVTA meets later this month, I'll be reaching out to the folks at PVTA about ridership numbers on those particular routes just to get you guys some more information relative to those particular suggestions. Um, and then we can you know, sort of have that more in-depth conversation about is that the best way to leverage the money? Is that going to have the most impact that we want? Uh, is, is that something that we want to, uh, you know, look at a more contractual arrangement which guarantees support for it? Um, and if that can be done, I don't even know uh, at this point. Um, there's one other point I wanted to make. Yeah, let's see if I can remember what it was. Um, one other now I'm not remembering. We'll, we'll so just pause questions. and see. Let's see pause and see if we have questions. Sure. Pat. Yes, I'm um, wondering if the 31 bus uh, goes to the survival center, I believe. Is that accurate? And if it does, bike share is not going to help with that route. So, because um, it's costly uh, for some people. And so I'm curious. So I will answer that question in just a moment because I'm actually going to look up <laughs> the PBTA bus site because I don't recall right off the top of my head. I want to say it might. Um, That's bus 33. 33 goes there. I think 31 is just. 31. Um, Actually, 31 goes all the way to Cliffside if you, if you fund it all the way. I mean, if it, in its full addition, but I don't know if there's a stop. I'm not seeing the actual um, stop on Sunderland Road, whether or not it stops. I think it might. Um, Are there other questions? Yes, Evan. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around all of this. Um, you mentioned uh, federal, state, and local funding. Uh, but the five colleges also contribute, correct? That's part of the that's part of the local. That part of the local. How, do, and I'm sure this is more technical than you can discuss right now. But is there some? How does their contribution calculated very generally? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll actually paint. I, and I wanted to do that. Maybe that was the other point I was going to make about sort of the local assessment, sort of what we're charged. So if you were to go and look at the Department of Local services, they have the, you know, estimates of the cherry sheet. You shouldn't look at our estimated cherry sheet for transportation because it is incorrect. They took our exact number from last year and doubled it. So I think they either got information incorrectly from uh, PVTA or someone at the DLS just didn't type it in right. Because if you look at any other communities within uh, the, the PVTA area, their assessments are flat. So what happens is, is our assessment that we pay um, uh, to PVTA is, is, is held on the cherry sheet. And, and essentially what it is is that the cherry sheet holds um, revenue and, and uh, assessments of things we owe that the state just sort of takes care of before they actually send us a check of money. Um, so that assessment, however, when you look at that for us, is the entirety of what happens within our community. Once that happens, we will be assessed that full amount. Um, and our full assessment for transportation relative to the you know, PVTA uh, is over a million dollars. The amount we as a town pay is far, far less. 
because we have arrangements and agreements with both Five Colleges Inc. and the university, not the transit service part of the university, but the actual university itself, that uh, lays out how that gets divvied up. It's basically driven by whether a route is wholly theirs, meaning the, the universities or, uh, or the five colleges, or if it's a shared route and uh, there's estimates made about ridership and then it's divvied up that way. Our actual assessment in total, before, before it gets sliced that way, our assessment in total is based upon uh, the number of miles driven within our community. And so when PVTA works through its numbers, the amount that it assesses all the municipalities combined can only go up by 2.5%. That is fixed by state law, Chapter 168, if I remember correctly. So that goes up 2.5%. But then they take that number, and then they slice it based on how many miles are driven in your community. So in communities that have, say, a construction project one year that cr increases the mileage that a particular route that's very busy, their assessment can go up quite a bit in a year like that because their mileage went way up. So that can happen to us, but in general, our assessment will go up about 2.5% because the mileage doesn't change a lot. Um, there are variances relative to construction and that sort of thing. Um, when I know Hadley's changed pretty significantly when uh, the bridge on, let's say, 47 was not able to take the bus. Mm -hmm. That changed their assessment pretty considerably because the, the routes were uh, changed considerably around that. Um, but uh, the long story short is that our assessed amount that you would see currently shows $2 million in something, which is absolutely not correct <laughs> um, if you were to go to the DLS website. But our assessment is then sliced between us and UMass and Five Colleges, Inc. And we actually pay a fairly modest percentage of that. Of course, I can't remember what we paid last year, but it's a few hundred thousand dollars, a couple hundred thousand maybe for our piece out of the million, okay. something like that. Um, so a fairly modest amount, but um, you know it's a, a pretty um, modest amount for the amount of service we as a community get. Shalini. So one of the things that I'd heard during my campaign in South Amherst was uh, the bus routes getting dropped out during summertime. So I was wondering if that happens throughout town or is it or you know certain routes that get uh, knocked out, and then what is the criteria for deciding which routes get dropped out? And I think I heard you say you're going to work on it, but I don't know if right now there's a process to determine or criteria to determine which routes. So the so they typically, I mean, in a, in a university town, as we all know, if summer rolls around, we're a lot smaller than we are during this time of year. And as a result of that, the ridership is less, and so that they, ha they have traditionally and always had uh, decidedly reduced schedules during those time periods. Now, there's certain routes that don't run at all during school vacations and summer and that sort of thing because there just aren't riders to ride them. And some of those routes are funded by, uh, there are some routes that are wholly funded by five colleges and the university in, in total. Um, uh, for most routes, there is a reduction in service over the course of summer, and it's, it, you know, the, uh, the PBTA regularly looks at their ridership and, uh, and looks at whether or not they need to adjust routes relative to ridership. Um, sometimes that's driven by funding questions. Um, so when we, over the last couple of years, when, when the PBTA has go, had to go through the process of reviewing their routes and, and that sort of thing, how they were choosing to make cuts was to impact the fewest number of riders as possible. Um, but also, you know, those that fall on vacation times for schools tend to be priority targets because they carry so few riders. It's not to say it's not incredibly difficult for those who do need those. Um, you know, they certainly, uh, you know, and, and uh, you get less of that in, say, the southern tier, which is your Chicopee, Holyoke, Springfield area. They get a lot less of that uh, changes to the schedule during, you know, sort of uh, summer and, and spring break and that sort of thing. There are a few routes, though, that go to, like, Westville State, and Springfield Technical Community College that have some altered schedules in the summertime. Um, but they do look at that. They have an operations person that's looking at those kinds of things all the time. Um, but that's part of, uh, you know, part of what came out of the last couple years of the state budget was a task force um, on which the PBTA administrator served, along with a, uh, about a dozen other folks, to look at 
you know, what are the right performance measures? How do those regional transit authorities do their work and decide which routes and how they go about doing their business? Now, PVTA being as, as large as it is, has always done that kind of analysis. Uh, some of the smaller ones, you get to Franklin County or Berkshire or some of those that are much, much smaller, um, you know, they don't have the resources, but they also, um, you know, may not have the time, you know, that resource as well as the financial resource to do some of that kind of analysis. And so, so that's some of the push, I think, from, from sort of the, I think, and I'm presuming this, but my guess is from the governor's point of view is that we need to take a different approach to this as a whole, which is part of why they formed a task force. Uh, let's look at transportation in a much different way. Um, it's been a bit, you know, from an advisory board standpoint, it's been a bit draconian, but at the same time, I understand the, the need to go in and do that kind of analysis and what's the smart way to spend our money on transportation. Uh, there are a few things that have come out of the task force um, relative to, uh, and this was a, a point that our, the PVTA administrator made, is that one of the critical pieces that came out of the task force uh, materials that they, they put forward was to uh, a change in mindset between uh, an infrastructure related to vehicles and more about moving people. So getting away from sort of a car, you know, truck viewpoint of the infrastructure and the transportation system to one of a more holistic one that involves potentially even walking, but certainly rail, bicycle, public transportation, private transportation, all of those things. So, so that little shift is, is, a, is an important one. Now, whether it'll have a material effect as far as budgeting is concerned, I don't know yet. Um, the other thing I want to mention was that tomorrow, and unfortunately I will not be able to go, there is going to be a, a luncheon with legislators and regional transit authority uh, advisory board members and, and uh, administrators uh, tomorrow in Boston where they're going to talk about the current budget situation. So I think it's an opportunity for um, those regional transit authorities to talk about the sort of pain that they will suffer as a result of not getting supported or what their concerns are about. Uh, you know, having money tied with, you know, having strings attached, as it were, which is kind of how it's been the last year or two relative to, oh, you can get an additional $3 million or, what, you know, X million, you know, number of dollars, but you have to perform this, 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 and this. Uh, you know, they can express those concerns. The difficulty the PVTA itself has, as far as the staff of PVTA, they cannot lobby the legislature. Um, that's not allowed. Um, advisory board members can. And obviously we can. Ms. Um, Dom is still here, or I would say, hopefully she's going to the meeting tomorrow. I cannot make it. Um, I went last year. Um, but I think that it is um, critical for, for communities outside of the sort of 495, outside the MBTA sort of service area to um, try to uh, collectively impress upon those that are inside that area that it's, it's a valuable investment to, uh, to support regional transit authorities. Dorothy, you had a question. Um, this is just to suggest that the way to evaluate a bus route is not by seeing how many people it affects, because if you keep cutting it, then people don't even use it in the first place, and it just is in a death spiral, which I think it is. Um, is there any group that is connecting, doing a survey of jobs that might, for example, the buses that are cut off at 9 o'clock in the summer. So if you had a job and you were using them to get home, you have to quit the job if you can't find a ride. Is there any group that is do doing an economic analysis of, uh, of employees who have jobs that get out at certain times and then check the pool of people that might actually have those jobs to see if there were a stable bus service that they would use it? So I, I, would, I would have to say that um, I maybe oversimplified the, you know, ridership is a factor. It's not the only factor that they look at when, it, when doing those analysis. For example, um, last year, uh, one of the suggested uh, changes to bus routes was uh, the, when the last bus went in and around the Holyoke Mall at Ingleside. And uh, the conversation, some of the feedback that they got through the public hearing process from, from the management of the, of the mall was to say, we have people who cannot get home, and so we'll have to close the mall an hour earlier if you have the bus stop an hour earlier. Yeah. 
And so there, those kinds of factors, you know, they don't always know that at the beginning of the process, and that's part of why there is a public hearing process, mm -hmm. so they can see and hear about those kinds of things, because there's subtleties. Um, you know, and, and certainly advisory board members have talked uh, to the, and expressed opinion to the, to, the, uh, to the operations people, have you reached out to some of the larger employers in like the Springfield area, do you want to sponsor a bus? Um, because you have a number of people who ride to get to work. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the, with, the, uh, with the MGM casino being open, they actually just bought some loop, a thing they call the loop, a service uh, in and around the downtown Springfield area to get people to their casino. But it has the ancillary effect of getting the workers to the, to the casino or other places in downtown. So, so those economic impacts are important ones that are, are evaluated. They're sometimes tricky to do evaluate, but that's certainly the public hearing process helps with that because people can come say, I can't get to work. People make decisions about where to live uh, based on a reliability of service. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's been difficult for me as an advisory board member is, you know, the, the, uh, the current administration in, in the State House, uh, in the Governor's Mansion, has, has had strong pushes for things that are in the uh, economic development realm and the housing realm, and I think the third latest tool is the transportation realm. And I think that's potentially why they're, they're looking at it the way they are, but I think that's a, the that's a third piece that people can't get to and from work. Um, it doesn't matter if the jobs exist or not, they can't, they can't get there. Kathy, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to build, I think, on what Dorothy was asking about the specific bus routes we're, we're talking about. So my understanding is it the issues are evening hours and then also s summer hours. And I don't have any ability to say how many people might be affected, but I know when I was campaigning, several people mentioned they could no longer get to work in the morning. Right. And they weren't using their car. You know, it was a single car family, so right. it was now uh, more car dependent. So I think one of the things Amherst has been looking at is uh, sort of sustainability in terms of less reliance on cars if possible. So there's a larger issue with these bus routes of if we could sustain service, more people would ride them right. and be less car dependent. So I don't, you said ride share versus buses. I guess I'd like to think of them together because you know you don't necessarily get on a bike at seven in the morning when right. you're coming home at eight o'clock at night and ride a bike. You know, right. so it's like it's, it's doing this. So what I don't know is what would be the cost to us. Say we wanted to commit, I uh, agree on, you don't want to reopen a route or reopen hours if next year it's going to be cut. So if we said we could do this this year, next year, and you know, we'd look at what those budgets are, the way right. we do some other capital spending, um, would that? How much would it take to secure keeping some of these routes open? And is there a way of assessing? Is that worth it? So there is. There are ways to assess that, um, and they have staff that that uh, you know. There, there's the cost to just run the routes. And in, in some ways, the, the local uh, UMass Transit service, which is a independent, but not wholly independent of the university, but it is independent, a uh, provider of service to the PVTA, uh, can give some estimates of, of what some of those things cost. Um, there are some additional costs from an administrative standpoint. Um, the, the ability to ask the questions and say, well, you know, what's the ridership like? What's the cost associated with this? That sort of thing. That is, you know, part of what their operations people do. Um, the struggle they're in at the moment is that they're looking for a new person in that role. <laughs> so that limits their ability to do it. It's not that they don't want to or can't. Uh, they kind of can't because they don't have a person in place yet, I don't believe. I've not heard an announcement relative to that. So they've, they've, uh, they've had a little turnover in that role and responsibility. Um, but certainly that looking at those, those factors and, and sort of, you know, what's the ridership like um, are, are, and, you know, and, and again, through feedback from the, from the public hearing process, over the last couple of years, they know uh, as people have come forward and said, hey, this, this impacts me financially because I can't get to my work or, you know, uh, we're going to have to explore other op options relative to this. Um, that has been recorded, duly noted, you know, and, and, and factored in as best they can when they think about strategies of mitigation and, and, and uh, analysis. And, and it, what's interesting to see, is, you know, sort of from a purely uh, 
abstract point of view is what is initially proposed over the last two years they've had to make a considerable number of cuts. And so what's initially proposed versus what ends up being the actual things that happen. Um, and there's a pretty significant difference between those two pieces by virtue of the fact that they get feedback from the public at large and they want to hear from people. The, the hard part for the folks at PVTA is their hands are a bit tied, so they come to the meeting and get not yelled at, but people are less than happy with them. Uh, and it's really not their fault. It's just a, it's an artifact of, of the fact that, that uh, the money is, doesn't exist. And so they're then having to make the best of a bunch of bad choices. Uh, and they're trying to find out what the least uh, unpleasant ones are for all involved. And, and uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, problems those kinds of uh, reductions in service cause are real for people. Um, you know, if you've uh, bought a home, rented an apartment, now you have a lease, you've gotten a job, uh, whatever those kinds of things are, um, there are real and significant impacts when the bus service no longer serves you in a way that it did that made it possible. Um, uh, so it's, it, it, the, they are cognizant of and, and trying to be appreciative of those kinds of things and, and certainly trying to keep track of, of various impacts as they look at those things. And we, we could get an estimate on if we, if we were willing to say we do a sequential year, they could give us, us an estimate. Yeah, I mean, I, I was looking back before the meeting tonight, I was looking a little bit at some of the changes that were originally post proposed last spring, most of which didn't go into effect. But, uh, you know, they, one of the metrics was number of bus trips, trips affected. And so I was looking at, um, actually on the 30 and 31, the sort of, it was nights and weekends, sort of late night and weekend, and it was like 9,000 trips. You think, well, that's a lot of riders. You know, but it's not 9,000 people. You know, but when you look at, say, the same route where there was a reduction between 35 minutes between buses and an hour between buses, that impacted like 150,000 mm -hmm. trips. So the, the, it's sometimes hard to understand the numbers, and I, but I think we can get those kind of numbers, and I think that's valuable, very, very valuable piece of information as we, as we look at what are some options, how I, we want to uh, support this in a way that's different and distinct from our just base assessment. Um, are there any other? Yes, Alyssa. So appreciating all of my former colleagues' work on this over the years, but even prior to when he was on the select board, it's. I don't want to depress anybody, but it's nowhere near that simple. We've tried having this conversation before where we said, okay, we know of four people who absolutely can't get to work. So what would it cost to run that bus for those four people? Because that's really important to us that we run it like an extra hour or we run it longer into the summer or however we do that. And it's been nearly impossible to get those numbers, no matter who's staffing what from PVTA in the past. So it's really hard for them to take it down to that granular level. So I don't deny that it would be a marvelous idea, but it, the reason it hasn't been done is because we haven't been able to get it done before, even with all the discussion each year about potential cuts. Well, what would it cost? Well, then what would happen? It seems like you ought to just be able to get kind of a per writer thing and say, well, it'll cost us this much to do this, and it'll cost us that much to do that but it never seems to be quite that simple. So that's why it hasn't ever been brought to us that way. So maybe as that group, as the various groups keep working on how do we pull this apart, is there a better way to do that so that Amherst could say, yes, we want to invest X amount more into buses, and we just haven't been able to figure out a way to give that money to make that work. Right, and I, I think that, um, I think assessing those numbers is a little more available than it has been in the past. I think they have had to do it, for one thing, more often, and I think, therefore, they've invested in some software tools to do that a little more often than they've had to in the past. So I think that's changed a little bit, so it's a little bit easier. At the same time, it's one of those things where, um, you know, you sort of change something here, and it changes these other four things. It's a bit of a guess. It's, it, you know, it's very broad and round numbers. So, you know, it, it's sometimes you want to keep in mind that it's one of those things you want to keep monitoring after the fact, um, because it, it will change uh, the dynamics of people's circumstances and, and, and uh, choices people make about which bus to ride will change significantly um, depending on availability. But you know, reliability is a really key piece for people, uh, especially around the economic aspect. Um, it's also, you know, even for students, I mean, if you talk to people at five colleges, you know, they're like, we need to be able to get people, we don't want, them, we don't want the bus to stop seven times between you know, uh, UMass and Smith because somebody can't get on the bus 
get to a class and get back in time. Although, if there's too many stops, they end up missing too many, it impacts their schedule in a way that they can't even take the class at another college in the five college because the, the time involved in the transportation is just too great. Um, so they, they like those express routes and they fund them. Um, but you know, any changes to, to those have those kind of alternate effects on, on, on ridership and Are the availability of, you know. Yes, things. Andy. Yeah, I guess I need to just comment on a couple things uh, for the benefit of uh, my fellow counselors. Uh, we fund our contribution to PVTA from the Transportation Enterprise Fund. <clears throat> the source of funds in the Transportation Enterprise Fund is the parking revenue from all of the different aspects of parking revenue. And um, so I have a couple of um, just additional observations without wanting to draw a conclusion because this is really for information. One is that Yes, when I was campaigning, as we all were, for our um, election last n November, um, I heard a lot about transportation um, buses, but I also heard a lot about parking system transportation. And what we invest in trying to improve our transportation comes out of the enterprise fund also. And that's a budgetary decision that I think that we need to be making with um, some care, um, which is all I, you know, I say, I'm not drawing a conclusion, I'm only pointing out the dilemma. Uh, because the only alternative is to say, well, let's take it out of general taxation and put it into the general budget. But we all know how tightly budgeted the general budget is and as I unfortunately use far too often, we get into the question of what new to do from the general budget. And I have to say something along the lines that uh, I think one of our consultants said to us uh, too, which is which police officer position are you gonna eliminate in order to do that? I mean, it's really that closely budgeted. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you on the Transportation Enterprise Fund is that last year, the select board voted to not recommend the amendment to add $53,000 to the Transportation Enterprise Fund expense in order to extend bus service um, during the summer months. Um, and the reason was that it was coming out of free cash in the Transportation Enterprise Fund, which was $91,000. So it was committing more than half of the Enterprise Fund's free cash on a one-year basis. Town meeting, of course, made the decision that it made and as it had the right to do. Um, but these are complicated issues and um, I think that um, I really appreciate the discussion that we've been having because I think we need to keep having these discussions in order to understand the problem and address it appropriately as to what is the best transportation system for the town, how is it supported, how and uh, what are its priorities, and what means the most to our constituents. Are there other questions from the council? We did agree that there would be public comment at this. Are there people that would like to make public comment at this time? Rob? I'm gonna change my middle name to Galileo. Madam Chair, I, I enjoyed hearing from my colleague and friend, Mr. Slaughter. Um, it was at length. Uh, in your email to me, you granted me two minutes. To be honest, there's no way I could address all the points that uh, I agree with many of the things that Doug said in two minutes. So give me some guidance, because I'm not gonna take two hours or however long we just heard, but I would like to have enough time to summarize some thoughts about this, because I, 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 so I appreciate some guidance before I get started. We, we really restrict public
public comment to one to three minutes, so I'll give you three. Okay, well, I'll do my best. Um, first of all, three weeks ago I came here and I'm grateful for the time you provided then. I'm glad that you asked Doug to come in. The PVTA, I think he's referring to the person at PVTA who uh, resigned last year, who was a UMass graduate and who worked with uh, Glenn Barrington as a driver years ago and was quite competent. I, I think UMass Transit has all its staff intact and is doing a good job with that. Um, the reason I'm back is because a few days ago I shared with you a very specific proposal which I think should have been taken up back on May 15th, 2018. I did present it back then, it wasn't addressed. And here we are on March 4th, 2019, trying to do at least the minimum to restore one of a pair of core routes within Amherst that serve not only the university, they do pass through the university, but which serve two communities which are home to many people who live in um, affordable or even deeply affordable housing. These are the routes 30 and 31. They also go north to Puffton Village, which is uh, semi-affordable for many people. And uh, I'm gonna tell you how many people use those routes. The, the proposal is to just maintain the level of service that we had last summer, the evening service last summer, okay? This summer, those routes would lose their last trips of the day. And because of a slight complication with Route 31, which normally goes up to Sunderland, um, I've worked with the UMass Transit Director, Glenn Barrington, to make sure that there's a route engineer that can stay entirely within the town of Amherst so that there's no concern about expending town's funds, whatever their source. And I th think they rightly do come from parking revenue parking fines and fees. During July and August and also June, they're typically between 30 and 40,000 trips taken on those routes during those months. And a more meaningful number is the passengers per service hour. And what's interesting is that on those routes, even in the summer, there are between 40 and 50 passengers per service hour on each of those routes. That means that we're talking about 40 to 50 people that are gonna be impacted potentially by having the last bus of the day cut, regardless of uh, Councilor Pam's good comment that people may lose their ability to get home from work in the evening. And there are many people who work at restaurants and other places until after 9 p.m. These buses are gonna stop running by 9 p.m. The proposal that was before you as a potential proposal, and I think it needs to be addressed as quickly as possible if we're gonna not have people surprised come May 10th or so, which is when this reduced service comes into effect. The proposal was simply to essentially create a uh, additional trip at the end of the day on Route 30 to Belchertown Road, not going into Belchertown as the old summer trip went, but just that far. And then to return to Puffton Village, not go on to Sunderland, and then do the last run of the day to East Hadley Road area. And Glenn Barrington, who is a very knowledgeable person, I think the most knowledgeable person in the entire PBTA providership system, I mean, it's a, he's the UMass Transit Director, not only quickly worked out a potential schedule for that particular restoration of service, but also gave a quick estimate. And it's a fraction of the 53,000 that had been appropriated by our legislature last spring, and which the executive had the full authority to make use of uh, during the last 10 and a half months. Uh, and unfortunately, nothing has happened yet. Uh, that's only one of many things that could, could be done or could have been done to restore just the minimum amount of service. So I, as someone who has some experience on transit planning, I've brought this before you, and uh, I'm happy to share with those of you who want to analyze these fairly detailed passenger counts that I did get 
just before coming here, about 5 p.m. this afternoon. And again, I'm urging, since I heard Mr. Slaughter say this, and I'm grateful for that, that this is a restoration that would not require, at least doesn't expect it requiring uh, a full Title VI analysis, full set of hearings. It's a restoration of service that existed before, as I shared with you in an earlier message, and which I think is a first step in keeping the year-round residents of the town able to use transit to get to and from whatever they're doing, work, school, et cetera. Um, I, I made some notes, but I'm not gonna even address them, but I'm just gonna say that I, I really think this is something we need to act on now. If we don't, it's an it's a extreme disservice to a significant part of our population. And I've basically brought this to you, I hope, in a future meeting in the near, near future, uh, the two steps that I recommended to you, which again seem to make sense to Mr. Slaughter, at least be debated and considered. I'd love to be part of that discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there any further comment on this particular item at this time? Okay, Doug, yes. Turn on the microphone. Um, uh, if I hadn't made clear, I'm fully happy to look into the proposed suggestions that, that Mr. Custer's made. I'm interested in those for sure, and certainly we'll reach out to PVTA relative to what it would take uh, for us to, to potentially add that service and, and sort of think about those more complicated factors of contract and year after year and that sort of thing. I'll, I'll ask those questions as well, um, in addition to just the, the simple sort of this summer. Question. So I'll ask all of those kinds of things and, and try to get some answers back to you as soon as I can. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a five minute break. Okay. Um, I just want to mention again that at the request of the people who have proposed uh, the town meeting advisory committee we have moved we will be moving this item to another evening they were not able to um, have the people they needed here for that discussion um, the next item on our agenda 6b is the community resource committee charge and let me just um, preface this by saying I want to make sure we have a robust conversation about the charge itself at the end of that, we will need, however, to refer this to the Governance Organization and Legislative Committee just as a matter of practice. And then, but it, that is not around the substance as it is around format. So um, there are six people who have been working hard on this um, committee charge, and I am going to just uh, let them decide uh, who's going to speak to the charge. Well, Steve was going to read the charge. Okay, Steve. Yeah. I just want to preface it briefly. Uh, there was the charge, the wording of the... Oh. The wording of the charge had one omission uh, that was first put up on our site. Uh, it's correct now. If somebody doesn't have the correct version, I have copies of it here. Um, and so you may... Margaret, it was provided in our packets tonight, correctly? Yes. Tonight, right. Yes. So, and he may not have the sure. So I think I'm going to start on this. So please do. It was a um, pleasure to work with the group of six. So at our first meeting, we decided that we'd have six co-chairs, and actually each person kind of rotated taking leadership. At the second meeting, we elected Dorothy as our as our the, the those co-chairs that were there <laughs> elected Dorothy as our as our um, first among equals co-chair. So she's going to give the actual report. So um, I will read the actual charge. So um, starting at the beginning, we made a decision that Dorothy will explain in the report to propose the name Community Resources Committee. This is a standing committee of the council. Appointing authority as a town council president. We um, recommend five councilors, one year appointments. And the, um, so that's also said in the composition, the quorum is three councilors. The purpose is to advise 
to the Council on matters related to the economic vitality and quality of life in Amherst. In furtherance of this purpose, the committee shall focus on the following areas among others. Planning, zoning, land use, and the master plan. Community and economic development, including art and culture. Housing mix, housing affordability, and neighborhoods. The charge, the action of the committee shall include A, review and make recommendations to the Council on matters referred to the committee regarding proposed or potential changes to planning, zoning, or land use policies, proposed policies related to the public ways and public resources, proposed policies regarding housing and homelessness, policies regarding the relationship between the town and the Amherst institutions of higher education, proposed updates to the master plan, proposed measures to support the local economy of Amherst. Then B, collaborate and or coordinate with other town committees or departments as appropriate. And then C, upon request by the council, the committee may study and consider other changes affecting community resources, sustainability, and economic development. The committee may offer policy and other recommendations within its purview for council discussion and consideration. Okay, and then Dorothy, I guess you're next. Um, do you want me to read the report? No, you don't need to read it. Okay. Is there any, are there specific highlights, however? Well, specific highlights are that we made the name change uh, because we felt that there needed to be a multi-member uh, town committee on economic development, which would have non-counselors, uh, at least a certain number of them, uh, who are experts in various aspects of the business and economic development of the town, that this committee would consider economic development where it intersected with um, housing, residences, and the quality of life. And uh, also, uh, in the constant interest in arts and culture, some of that, in fact, also relates to economic development. But the concept was that if the uh, quality of life in the town was uh, very positive, that this would be a place where people would want to start businesses and to have businesses, and in fact, it would increase the economic vitality of the town. Um, another thing that we discussed was, um, particularly after um, town manager discussed public ways, which is a very complex subject, and I think he has a motion on that today, that um, we were, this committee was not seeking to, in any way, take over any of those functions, which the town does. It has a very complex and involved many departments. But if there were changes in policy or things that needed to be considered from that point of view, the committee would be interested in doing that. The focus on housing is very important. Uh, housing of all kinds, including affordable housing and um, things in a proper mix. Uh, so this is a place where housing, neighborhoods, economic development, uh, arts and culture, um, public ways, and town resources would come together with, and then we would also pay some attention to, but not be in charge of, just um, be, respond to the whole question of updating the bylaws, the zoning bylaw, and the master plan. But that would be done, I assume, by larger committees but that we would be one of the committees that looked at and thought about those things in terms of the rest of the charge of the committee. So there are four other members of this committee, Kathy, Shalini, George, and Pat. Do any of you at this time have any comments that you'd like to add? Just, just a quick statement. Um, we, we actually looked across a bunch of towns to see what are mm -hmm. other towns doing, and this is not an uncommon way of grouping. Um, a some towns call it jurisdiction rather than purpose, but mm -hmm. it's a way for the whole council to say, this requires more discussion, we're referring it to a committee. Um, and so we were looking at the scope in other towns for some guidance on how they defined it. So we, we were trying to make it clear that this would still be the council making a decision this requires more decision in referring it rather than it's coming from below. It's a service function to the council. And so these ideas for changes might come from outside the council. The planning board might be sending us something, but it would be a way that the 
more intense discussion could be focused. And I just want to build on what Dorothy said, this last minute change to community resources committee, because if there were a committee of the town called economic development, we thought it would be really confusing to have a committee of the council with the same name. So we just mm -hmm. picked a broader name to avoid future confusion. Okay. Any other comments from members of the committee? Shalini? Yeah, I just want to emphasize what Kathy just said about the Economic Development Committee um, for the town, um, you know, making sure that down the road that there is such a committee because that was my main interest, interest in uh, this community resource, no, what is it? Community resource, whatever, committee is how do we revitalize our economy within the context of uh, ensuring the quality of services within the, um, our commitment to our environment, to the people, and equity. So um, it seems like this is a broader committee that um, that's going to look at the different aspects without focusing on just the economic. And the idea was to then have a committee of the town to um, then focus on economic development. Pat or George, any comments? Okay. All right, let's open this up for general discussion of the council. Yes. I had two Alyssa. questions. The one, the one that I realized before I got here was in item C where it says upon request by the council, I'm really not trying to reword Smith this because I know you guys worked really hard to get it to this point. I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear. So there are two sentences in C and am I supposed to perceive those as having an and, or is there actually a D that says, without referral, the committee may offer policy and other recommendations? Because I'm trying to understand everything up until then is upon request of the council, when it's been referred by the council, but then that one sentence says may offer policy, and I presume that's in response to a referral by the council, but I would just want to be sure that we're all on the same page. Okay. Is there anybody in the group that wants to respond to that? Didn't, didn't you write that one, Steve? <laughs> Steve, you get to respond. Yeah, that's an excellent point, and I need to take it under, a, take it under advisement. Because um, we, we did discuss mainly that we saw the operation as being referral, from, that the council would be referring mm -hmm. ideas to the to the committee, but we also left open the possibility that the reverse happens, that the committee can say, we think it's important that we study blank. But in both cases, the council would be consulted. But we wanted to leave open this opportunity that, that this committee itself, it wouldn't completely be reactive, that it could be proposing, you know, proposing um, things within this charge, uh, things within this mission. Yes, Alyssa. If I could then follow up, I would not object to that then being split into C and D. I just okay. don't want it to, to stay within C if that's, if that's okay. the factual situation. And then the other quick question I had was based on something I may have misunderstood that was being stated by another counselor when I walked in, is the planning board would not be sending anything straight to this committee, right? The planning board, or would they? Wouldn't the planning board be sending things to the council and then we'd be referring it? Or what, what's the thought behind that? That's... Yes, Kathy. The thought was it comes to the full council, and then to the extent it needs a lot more conversation, or it's a 13-person conversation. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's a decision that gets made at the council level. Okay. Other questions, clarifications? Yes, Mandy Jo. So I, I had a question about A. Everything but the fourth bullet point has the word proposed in front of it. And so I was curious whether there was a specific decision to not put proposed in front of the policies regarding the relationship between the town and Amherst Institution of Higher Education, or was it accidentally left out? I'm just curious why that one's missing proposed. Out. I believe it was accidentally left out. I, I, I think it was actually somewhere between accidental and mindful. Um, okay. I stand corrected. Yeah. I wasn't Dorothy. at the second meeting. <laughs> I think we got tired of using the word proposed. Well, 
So I'm just going to ask a question. Um, if we put the word proposed in there, does that mean we can't um, consider and discuss things that exist right now, the status quo? You could say proposed and or revisions to existing policies. Okay. <laughs> She's not looking. Um, can I? Yes, I, Mandy Jo. I wonder if that proposed or potential or proposed, I mean, that argument could be made for almost every bullet point mm -hmm. in yeah. A. Um, not to be a wordsmith either, but if we're looking at wanting this committee to look not only at things brought to it, but potentially current right. policies, mm -hmm. we might want to look at a rewording of all of those or somehow get the proposed and current somewhere in there maybe in the statement before the bullet points or something. Okay. I agree. All right. Darcy. I have made this proposal before, but um, I just wanted to repeat um, uh, my suggestion, my earlier suggestion that we add the concept of sustainability in the permit and um, just um, to reference the, um, the master plan, uh, it says sustainability is a primary integrating goal of the Amherst community and this master plan, a broadly accepted definition of sustainability appears in our common future a report commissioned by the United Nations. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the pre present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And then it says, uh, the goal of sustainability underlies each of the key directions for Amherst Master Plan. So I believe that um, the town is going to be going through a process over the next few years, you know, through our climate committee and in other ways of really starting to wrap our heads around integrating sustainability into every single thing we do. And so this committee in particular uh, really needs to have that in the purpose. So if we could just even just take one of those sentences from the master plan and just put it in there, a phrase. I have a suggestion which I would be glad to put forward as uh, um, an amendment to the motion to adopt this. I don't know, are we adopting this tonight? Uh, no, not well, necessarily, we'll decide that. Okay, I'll just suggest that, um, that we could in the sentence um, purpose to advise the council on matters related to the economic vitality and quality of life in Amherst and the goal of sustainability, comma, a primary integrating goal of the Amherst community and of the town master plan, which is pretty much exactly what the master plan says. So that would just be having it pertain to all of these issues around Amherst resources. Would you complete, uh, would you read back to me, and the goal of sustainability? Comma. Comma. A primary integrating goal of the Amherst community and of the town master plan, which is just a, just, I had to change some tenses in there a little bit to fit into the sentence, but it's the same wording as in the master plan. Margaret, do you have that? Yeah. But, but, uh, right. Okay. So we've kind of skipped around so far. The one suggestion has been made in the purpose, and it's after the word words "life in Amherst" and right. the goal of sustainability, a primary integrating goal of the. 
town of the Amherst community and of the town master plan. Of the Amherst community and the town master plan. I guess we could just say plan. and sustainability, which is a primary integrating goal of the Amherst community, rather than repeating goal twice. Okay. Margaret, did you get that? Quality of life in Amherst and sustainability, comma, which is a primary integrating goal of the Amherst community and of the town master plan. Okay. Pat. Yeah, um, I think that one I, one, I agree that we need to bring back the word sustainability because we're talking about sustainable economic development, blah, blah, blah. But I'm also feeling like the thing that Darcy just proposed is, could be um, simply stated if, we, if the purpose was using the master plan as a larger frame of reference to advise the council on matters of. Um, and I think that would be easier because the master plan has within it all the areas that this committee would be looking at. And, and this committee would be able to be working um, in collaboration with a lot of the other committees in town to really understand the impact more holistically. So I think we need to simplify this um, and, and add sustainability, but not in the frame that you suggested it. Dorothy. I will uh, recommend Darcy's words because the master plan um, is it one of the things that we're going to be examining. It's an updating. So I think that you put the emphasis you put on it, Pat, it might end up making it a, a bit of a straitjacket, but Darcy's words make it clear that the goals of the master plan, not necessarily the, every specific thing in it, but the overall goals are something that should be emphasized, including sustainability. Yes. Yeah. I feel like uh, when we're using the master plan as a larger frame, we're talking about the goals of the master plan. So I don't feel like it's a straitjacket because we've all acknowledged that the master plan has to be updated. We have to find a way to really collaborate on definitions so we all mean the same thing when it's written down and we're not interpreting it in different ways. I think it becomes uh, critically important um, that there be a way to uh, look at something that the planning board has decided and, and to see whether it fits with the master plan. Another aspect of this committee uh, really is to look at things more holistically and see the impact in other areas. And that's the other reason to use the frame of the master plan. Other, other comments? Andy. It's a little different because I'm not on sustainability, but I am on the master plan. Uh, master plan has very specific reference in our charter as to what the roles are of this body and other bodies in regard to the master plan. So I would suggest um, that uh, if we refer this to another committee or, uh, or if we decide this as a group, consider something in that bullet instead of proposed updates to the master plan, this proposed actions regarding the master plan in accordance with Charter Section 9.8. Okay. Other comments? Alyssa. Uh, two quick ones, and I'm sorry if I missed you discussing this earlier. Under charge where it says action shall, I would think that would be may in this case because we're not expecting that you necessarily have to report back on every one of these like in the next I'm 20 sorry, days. We're specifically where you're Charge, you actions of the committee shall, it should be actions of the committee may. Okay. And okay. I'm assuming that you will add proposed in front of that fourth bullet point or some other word out of the thesaurus. Um, the other question I had, again, if, sorry if you covered this, is under composition, I don't know why you would list the quorum. There's no reason to list a quorum unless it's something different than simple. <coughs> unless suddenly governance has decided we have to list quorum in every single charge. That, I'll just, I 
that was originally in there when we still had non-voting residents on it, so it, the clause, we just didn't get it out to say, yeah. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Other comments? George. One of the things that we uh, worked hard on was to come up with a very clear and simple statement of the purpose of this body. And I personally find this statement to be good as it stands. Um, we're concerned with matters related to the economic vitality and quality of life of Amherst. Um, so I would prefer to keep it as it is. I, I'm sorry, I heard, did not hear that last. I would prefer to keep it as it is. <coughs> okay. Are there other observations and comments? So we have two options here, as I see it. We have a couple options. We could try to wordsmith this here tonight, which I think is tough. We could refer this back to the ad hoc committee to take our suggestions and come back again. And um, to me, in many ways, that seems like the best um, option at this point. And we could suggest that not only do we refer it back to them, but upon their work on that, it would either come back to the council or it would go directly to the GOL. Yes, Mr. Bockelman, did you have some? <laughs> I was looking for your help here, you know. <laughs> he does not want to I just, I just bought into one of Evan's decision trees. <laughs> I mean, we could go this way or that way. Okay. Yes, Kathy. Hey, I just have a quick comment on that, Lynn. I think what I heard, um, ex with except for two places of a substantive issue. They were very good suggestions on the way to make the wording clearer, you know, splitting, mm -hmm. there wasn't any disagreement on that. So there's a adding a clause or not adding a clause to the purpose, right? Um, and then changing the wording on Andy's on actions. But so I'm, I'm just questioning whether you want to send it back to a, a committee or figure out George's, is it good except for this tinkering it, it, I don't really care. I mean, we can spend another couple hours discussing it, but we actually discussed these issues in the committee. <laughs> yep. um, Mandy Jones. Either way, just saying that I think there's yeah. one more substantive thing here. Most of the others are, Alyssa's separating it into two sentences, changing okay. a word from okay. shall to may, you know, so right. that, that's okay. just... I mean, I'm, yes, uh, Mandy Jo. So in the past, the council has had a policy. I know we're new, but the last couple charges that have come through here have been referred to GOL for one final look for clarity, consistency, and actionability. That um, review has not taken place with this charge yet. And so I... As chair of the GOL committee, I would hesitate to act on this charge tonight without it going through the GOL per our previous policies of sending these off for that final review. There was no intention to not do that. The question is whether or not we want to try to make substantive changes or we feel it's ready with the discussion here to just go to GOL. And I believe that uh, what Kathy has pointed out is the two substantive changes are really the one about whether or not sustainability gets added into the first area uh, under purpose, and the second one is... It may not be a substantive. Andy was, I think, suggesting its uh, proposed actions regarding the master plan and section, just a cross-reference to... Okay. So instead of the... Oh, to... I think that was a rewording of that bullet. Yeah, that's a, that's a clarity issue as far as I can see. Yes, Al, Evan. So it seems like there are some very minor changes that, that right. need to be made right. um, bef before this goes to GOL. 
Um, but I think one of the options you laid out, and I want to speak in favor of that option, would be for us to uh, essentially vote to refer this back to the ad hoc committee to make those final charges, um, but with the understanding that the ad hoc committee can then forward it directly to GOL mm -hmm. without it having to come mm -hmm. back to the council. Yes. Um, granted, the next if the next GOL meeting where it could be discussed would be March 27th, I believe. So there is a council, no? We're not gonna discuss it Wednesday. Well, uh, it, yeah, if when, the, Wednesday, it's on the agenda for Wednesday if it's here. Right, but if it still has to go back to the ad hoc committee, they have to post a meeting. Um, so likely not, so it, there is a council meeting in between now and the time that we would likely pull it up, but I don't think it needs to be brought back to the council to go to GOL. If, if we can make a motion that just says once the ad hoc committee is done, just send it directly to GOL. Steve? So I can't speak for all the other members of the ad hoc committee, but I think to a certain degree we thought that we've done our job and that we put the ball in play, and now it's up to town council to figure out what, how it wants to dispose of this. So I would, sorry fellow, <laughs> fellow ad hoc, fellow and fellow ad hoc um, committee members, but I would urge us not to refer it back to the ad hoc committee, but to take it to one of the, either take a vote on this tonight, or to take it to one of the standing committees, that, to one of the, it needs take to, a GOL, it or needs to, to vote go, on it tonight. It needs to go to GOL. To, okay. But I would urge us not to, to um, our, our job was to put the ball in play, which we've done. All right, Dorothy. I want to second George's comment. We were making, had many other sentences and they were all good and meaningful. And he was a strong voice for a simple, clear charge. And we all got rid of some of our favorite things. And I think there's something to be said for that. And I'm kind of curious to know about the rest of the uh, council's opinion on that. Um, and in reference to sustainability, it is mentioned in C and to consider other issues affecting community resources, sustainability, and economic development. So it is there. It's not in the same place of primacy that you're recommending, but I, there's a lot to be said for a very clear, simple, understandable charge. Further comment? Mindy Jo. So I'll, I'll take up Dorothy's recommendation and respond. I liked the general um, succinctness of what the six of you came up with. Um, so I would second George's thinking on the purpose statement. Chalini. I just have a clarifying question for the town council. So I think putting sustainability in the two different places has a very different meaning. The first one, as Darcy recommended, was saying that this is kind of the framework and starting to shift our culture towards making, integrating uh, all our decisions with, or at least intentionally investigating what would be the most sustainable option within this decision. And then putting it in C is that we will consider sustainability initiatives or issues. So I think as a town council, we want to maybe uh, decide, you know, how important and where does this issue stand? Okay, so I, we're not adopting the entire charge tonight. I want to be very clear. But if there is a sentiment that we want to vote on this issue of that first sentence and adding, then let me have a motion to that, and then we'll take it to a vote. So, Dorothy, you want to put it in the form of a motion? Darcy, Darcy I'm sorry. Darcy. <laughs> sorry. I'm uh, Oh. Okay, I move that we add after the words um, quality of life in Amherst the following words and sustainability, which is a primary integrating goal of the Amherst community and of the town master plan. Is there a second? Second. Alyssa. 
is a second. Any further conversation? Okay. All of those in favor of adding that phrase? Let's read it again. So the full sentence would read. The full sentence would read, to advise the council on matters relating to the economic vitality and quality of life in Amherst and sustainability, which is a primary integrating goal of the Amherst community and of the town master plan. Okay. It's been, motion's been made and seconded. Any further conversation? All those in favor of adding that phrase, please raise your hand. And, and, and when we say we're in favor, could we, it's, I mean, just the two, I mean. The, the favor it, means that we are going to add that phrase. What I mean is, can we just tweak it to make sense? But what I mean is the, it, it is, I want to include it in that, but it just should not read awkward. It feels it's a little awkward right now, but I would like to include that in the... Okay. All right. All those in favor? Yes. So are we doing what Shalini said, that if we're approving this in principle to be edited further? Yes, that's okay. fine. Approving the, then when it goes to the committee, if they, the GOL committee, they can tweak it for understanding. Okay? All those in favor? One, two... Okay. Opposed. Wait, 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 wait. wait. All yeah. Okay. I raised my hand. Yeah. All those in favor of adding this phrase at the end of that sentence. All those opposed. Abstain. What do we have? Pat. The vote was six, six in favor, six opposed, one abstention, so that motion fails. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Evan. So my understanding is what we're doing right now is finalizing the charge to go to GOL, correct? Yeah. No, we're finalizing the, we, all we did was deal with the one issue that had more substance to it. It's now going to GOL. We're going to have a motion for that. And once it comes back from GOL, we will have a motion to adopt the charge. So two other things that came up in our discussion was one, the idea of proposed being in front of policies, and two was the other one of splitting C into two different things, C and D. I would, I would argue that those are substantive and should be handled before it goes to GOL. We should vote on it. Yeah. Wait, All right. If there was any disagreement on that, I mean, we could just quickly do those word okay. changes That's and fine. send it back to you with those word changes in it. Yeah. Okay. So let's deal with the one that's under A referring to the fourth bullet that has to deal with policies. Do I hear a motion? It was mine, so. Yes, Mandy Jo. Um, I move to, in the fourth bullet point of A, add the word proposed in front of policies. Okay. Second. Discussion? Discussion? Is there a second? Okay, it's, it's been made and seconded by Evan. Yes, okay. discussion. But in her previous uh, speaking on this topic, Mandy Jo said, proposed and current, perhaps to be added to all of them. Okay. To all of the bullets. Yes. Okay. Do I? Mandy Jo? So, it was your motion. Someone else had suggested that. I don't have a problem with that. I had suggested maybe figuring out a better wording, but that can be done in GOL. Yeah. Okay. So, proposed and current. Proposed was the motion and seconded, yes. If Evan. we're if we're gonna write proposed and current, why even have either of those there's no third option. Might as well just open each bullet. Changes to planning and zoning, policies related, policies regarding. All right. I th I think we're getting into 
okay. I, this is one reason why I did not feel this was a substantive change. I felt this is something the GOL can deal with. Okay. Um, so we're going to withdraw the motion? Yes. Thank you. There was a, a fourth, fourth one, or third one, which was to separate C into C and D. May I hear the motion? George? Second. And seconded by Pat. Any further conversation on that? All those in favor? Opposed? No? Great. This, and now I have a, would like to hear a motion to refer so this. For one additional one about the master plan. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Under proposed updates to the master plan, a Andy, would you please read the motion the way you'd like it? Uh, proposed actions regarding the master plan in accordance with Charter Section 9.8. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. I'm sorry? Second, Pat. Any further conversation? So it would say proposed. Andy, do you want to read that again? Again, it's, it's on the bullet right now that reads. Pr proposed updates. Yeah, it's, it's under um, A, and it's where it's proposed updates to the master plan and change into proposed actions regarding the master plan in accordance with Charter Section 9.8. Okay, it's been, motion's been made and seconded. Any further conversation? All those in favor? Opposed? No, it's unanimous. Are there any other pe any other changes that we see that we need to vote on? Okay, then I'd like to have a motion to refer this to the to refer the charge of the committee on community resources community resources committee. Excuse me, to the governance organization and legislative committee as presented or as amended. I move that we do that. Okay. Is there a second? Kathy, any further conversation? All those in favor? Okay. It's a, the motion is to refer the charge of the Committee on Community Resources to the Governance Organization and the Legislative Committee as we have amended it. Okay. Okay. All those in favor? All right. That's unanimous. Um, motion was made seconded. Now, has the ad hoc committee approved all year minutes? There was uh, almost uh, there was one person who didn't respond yet, so I'll have to But get you have five people who have? Yes. Okay, then you don't, you have approved okay. minutes. Okay. 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 It's unanimous. Those, the committee has approved its minutes and uh, you looking at me a little strangely. <laughs> Question, Margaret. My understanding is that the committee needs to actually vote to approve the minutes. Alyssa? I don't know why that's true. We don't have rules that say we have to vote to approve minutes. Minutes can be approved any number of ways under mass law. And so since we haven't set rules that say that, you can assign one person to do it. You can say it's by consensus. You can vote to do it. But obviously, if you're going to vote to do it, you have to post a meeting to do it. So I don't see, we don't have that rule. Can I ask for a vote of that committee in this meeting? Clarification. Hmm? They're not posted. They are not posted. Okay. I'm going to suggest that at the next time that the council meets, that that group post a meeting. We'll call that meeting. You can vote on your minutes, and then we'll vote to dissolve. Okay. We did vote, the four of us who met, on the first set of minutes. On the first set, but the yeah. second set. And the second set, all four people approved them of the four who were there. Yeah, I was no one could them. Oh. So if you needed a majority vote. So they approved the minutes at the meeting. Yeah. Okay, then in that case, 
Um, I would like an, a motion to dissolve the Community and Economic Development Committee ad hoc. I so moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> motion has been made, seconded. All those in favor? Thank you. Excellent. Um, Can I make a very brief comment? Yes. I just wanted to say I really enjoyed this, and I think that the council can do something quickly when we put our mind to it, and we did it, and I think we did a good job. Thank you. Thank you, all six of you, all co-chairs. All 13. <laughs> okay, and the council. All right, we're moving on to the calendar for the regional school budget, and I'm going to call on Andy to introduce this topic. Okay. It's, it's hard to do this without uh, just touching on the whole report of the Finance Committee. Um, there are really four documents that you have that all touch in um, some way on this, one being the Finance Committee report that's dated February 27. One is a memo that I sent to you March, that's dated March 1st. Um, the um, calendar which you received today, which uh, uh, sets forth dates, and then, the, of course, the draft motions, um, which encompass proposed language to deal with all of the recommendations of the committee. Um, just to touch on the report really quickly, because it's, uh, I'm going to really do mostly about the school budget, is that um, we have been working, as indicated in part two, um, on the questions of the capital projects and um, the schools in particular, and we're um, hoping that there will be a report on um, the 12th of the month, um, if not the succeeding meeting from um, Sean Mangano uh, responding to questions that are outlined there. Um, but the major issue that we're confronting is something that I've brought to the attention of the committee several times before, so I'm not going to go into it in great detail because it's also explained in both of those memorandums that you have um, that if we um, don't consider the budget separately, uh, we will, for the regional schools, um, the other three towns will have acted on the budget, and if they adopted the budget, they will be adopting a budget that's bounding on Amherst without any action out of the council. And uh, so that uh, we uh, think that it is important to exercise the discretion that's allowed us in the charter to um, separately consider the regional school budget from the rest of the budget so that we can take up the budget as a council at a time that's more commenced, um, uh, commensurate with the town meetings of the other three towns. So that is the uh, first and probably most important action for tonight. Then there are two other subsidiary actions that are proposed that flow from it. Um, one is to uh, have the um, have, have, have a uh, referral automatic, in other words, vote now in advance of getting the referral of the budget from the Regional School Committee to the Council and um, just have a motion today or um, in our next meeting that upon receipt it is automatically referred to the Finance Committee so that the Finance Committee can start to work on it because it doesn't have a whole lot of time to go through the process of conducting the hearing that is required and have the consideration that has to be there. And then the third, which is a separate um, action, which I can talk about it, um, later after we've addressed the other uh, points, if you, um, or now, which, as the president wishes, which is um, to schedule an additional um, Finance Committee meeting for town, town council. Uh, excuse me, town council meeting um, for the 29th of um, April, I believe, is the date in order to consider the budget as opposed to considering it on the 22nd. Okay. Are there any questions specifically about these issues? Okay, then I am going, yes, I'm sorry, Mindy Joe. 
My only one is I didn't see this calendar to have a vote on the, um, I, I always forget what it's called, the regional asse assessment, thank you, the assessment portion. Is that going to be done at the same time we do the regional budget or the, the regular budget? Or is it something that comes up whenever it's ready from the region? Andy. Uh, the way that the process works is that the regional school committee will recommend a budget that includes an assessment method for the year, and it is a single recommendation. And of course, it's structured so that it goes to all four communities at the same time, since the other three communities are acting on it as part of their town meeting. Um, it is frequent that it is split into two or uh, I, uh, articles, and uh, but it is uh, based upon one submission. Um, I, I, the finance committee's interpretation is is that it's all a part of the same budget action, and whether the council ultimately is dealing with it as one motion or two is a matter to be that can be determined later. Okay. Yes. Evan. Uh, so I just want to make sure I'm clear on everything that's being proposed. So the, uh, the first motion makes sense. The second motion um, is basically to say that once the regional school committee approves the budget, it will automatically go to finance committee, not having to wait for referral at our March 18th meeting. That's correct. And the uh, the third one, the, the rationale behind that is that uh, the uh, finance committee doesn't believe it would have enough time between March 12th and April 22nd to actually bring a recommendation to the council by the April 22nd meeting. Andy, you want to speak to that? Um, I will speak to it and then I'll ask other members of the committee to speak to it too because I feel um, a little bit awkward about this particular point. And uh, the, um, I will be away on the 22nd. Um, my ability to uh, participate remotely in that meeting is questionable because of the circumstances of my absence. And so the question that was before the Finance Committee was whether it was comfortable um, having the regional budget considered here at the council in my absence. I am perfectly fine with that decision. The committee uh, made a determination that their recommendation was otherwise, and uh, that's where it is. And, and which one of the four of us would like to echo that one? <laughs> <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> The, let me just say that the rest of the Finance Committee feels that given Andy's knowledge of the regional school budget and the process of assessment uh, is critical for the councils to understand this as they take their vote. We want him to be here. Evan? So I understand that. Um, so, and then the reasoning behind not just trying to take it up at the May 6th meeting, which would still be before one of the four towns brings it up, is that if it's not done in that meeting, then we don't have the flexibility. So April 29th allows us the flexibility to push it back. That is correct. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the rationale. Right. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions about the timeline or... So I'm going to begin the motions, all right? Um, I'm going to make a motion that in accordance with Section 5.5C of the Amherst Home Rule Charter, I move to separately consider an act on the Amherst Pelham Regional School District budget due to the agreement with the three other towns in the Regional School District and that in compliance with Section 5.5A and 5.5B of the Amherst Home Rule Charter adopts the schedule as outlined in the memo from the Finance Committee Chair Andy Steinberg dated March 1st, 2019 regarding the proposed schedule 
for regional school district budget. Is there a second? Second. Mandy Jo is the second. Further discussion on that? All those in favor? It needs a roll call. Oops, roll call. No, that's not the one that needs the roll call. This one is allowed without a roll call, am I correct? Second one is noted to require a roll call. I'm looking to you, Mandy Jo, because of the charter. I'm not sure that roll call wasn't yeah. included because we expected an absent member who's going to be able to participate. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, hello? It won't hurt to do a roll call. Let's do roll call. Okay. The town clerk will read the names. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. Second motion. Uh, I move in, court, in accordance with Section 5.5A of the Amherst Home Rule Charter. I move to refer the budget recommendate, recommended by the Regional School District for fiscal year 2020 to the Council's Finance Committee upon receipt by the Town Council. Is there a second? second. Pat was a second. Is there any further conversation? Okay, then roll we'll call vote. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Balmill? Yes. The vote's unanimous. Okay, and then finally, to schedule an additional meeting, I move to schedule an additional meeting of the Town Council to be held at 6.30 p.m. on Monday, April 29th, 2019. Is there a second? Second. second. Ryan is a second. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. There, it was 12 for it and one abstention. All right. Uh, Paul or Andy, we're going to, oh, no, actually, I want to use the opportunity of already being on the issues of the Finance Committee to just ask Andy briefly to report on the Four Towns meeting of this last Saturday. Well, Four Towns meeting this uh, last Saturday really dealt almost in its entirety with the uh, question of the assessment method. And uh, at, the, at the point where we went into the meeting, the committee of four people, one from each town that had worked on the issue and considered and eliminated dozens of different methodologies had come down to two and uh, both of them were considered um, at the meeting and the decision on which to recommend was a unanimous decision. Um, all four towns were ultimately in support of it. Um, the understanding is that we would try and do, do the method that was talked about for two years and that it would then uh, be subject to review. And um, essentially it is to move towards the direction of um, a methodology that is 50% based upon what is known as the minimum contribution that's required for each town um, and uh, with the balance, um, but not just on the regional, uh, on 50%, but on a five-year average of the region of that minimum contribution and then the rest based upon the 
current regional agreement method, which is the five-year rolling average of enrollment. Um, one of the things that was very attractive uh, about this process uh, that would come out of this is that uh, because everything is being based upon averages over a longer period of time that go backwards four years, that there's a much higher degree of predictability going into the process as to what the uh, proportion um, expected from each town will be going forward. And that predictability was um, ultimately the attractive factor of that method that um, swayed both the small committee and the larger discussion that happened on Saturday. Okay. Any questions or comments? All right, then uh, we're going to move on to the calendar of the town budget. Uh, and Paul, I believe you're going to speak to that. Um, <clears throat> there's really no action required for the council at this point, so that's why that motion on your motion sheet is, is eliminated. Right. Did you want to speak to the calendar itself at all? Oh, that's the Finance Committee's calendar that's okay. in your packet. To, um, I think that's outlined a little bit in the memo from the Finance Committee. Okay. Um, and then that establishes uh, a fairly aggressive schedule for the Finance Committee during May. Once they get the budget, they will be meeting twice a week. Uh, I think there'll be consistent discussion, uh, the president has talked about having discussion with other members of the council as to whether they want to be present for some of those discussions because those will be pretty intense discussions. Once the finance committee um, makes its recommendation to the full council, uh, you will have uh, 30 days basically to uh, vote on the, um, on the budget during the month of June. So I think working on that schedule that is good for the finance committee to come up with its plan of action for the to get to this to get get to the recommendation to the council, which is what is in front of you tonight. Okay. And did you did you have any further comments? I think the only things that I would note about this is when you look at the finance committee budget and it talks about FY19 budget review. The purpose of those reviews is to use the current budget and how it is structured and what it proposes as a way of familiarizing the Finance Committee um, as to how the budget will be structured that they're looking, that we're all looking at, quite frankly. Um, that the critical pieces, of course, are the ones that talk about FY. 20 budget because they are about actions that we're actually going to be taking. Um, the finance committee that existed previously as a body of town meeting would regularly um, through the course of February and early March meet with all um, department directors um, and department heads in order to hear from them about the proposed budget and to be able to ask questions that relate the budget back to the operations of the department, which is ultimately what budgets are about. Um, and uh, the Finance Committee will be doing that on the very aggressive schedule that um, was uh, just described by the town manager. And of course, the, that was the um, point that uh, if other members of the council um, wish to attend, um, we certainly would consider that as a reasonable action. I think that um, uh, the, the president will need to speak to that later because the um, requirement would be that there has to be some mechanism of knowing how many people are actually are gonna be there and whether it needs to be posted as a meeting of the council in addition to a meeting of the committee. Uh, and then based upon the information that we'll receive um, can take the action that's required to us in the charter in making a recommendation to uh, the council as a whole and then the council will have um, the period in June to take the action that is specified again in the charter. 
So let me just mention that specifically May 7th, 9th, 14th, and 16th is when we as a finance committee will be hearing from the various town departments. It is not our intention to bring them back to the general town council when we look at the budget, uh, unless necessary. Um, so I will be asking um, Angela Mills to be polling people to determine whether you plan to attend those any of the any of the additional dates, so that we know whether or not we need to call a committee of the whole, meaning a committee of the council. Um, and so please be responsible, responding to Angela when I send that email out. Um, I also want to mention um, that, as you've seen in all of this, um, we start this Thursday with a public forum on the budget. That's where people talk about what they'd like to see in the budget, and the town manager talks about the budget. Uh, it is an, a regular, it is a special council meeting, so we will call it. And then later on, on the 21st, you notice in this calendar, we have a public hearing on the budget. Um, and then finally, we hope to adopt the budget before the end of June. In fact, we legally have to, or we'll be sitting here till two in the morning. <laughs> um, anything else, Alyssa? Associated with the comment you made about posting a meeting of the whole, I can't possibly stress enough, just go ahead and post those meetings as town council meetings. Okay. They're not regular meetings. They're not part of our regular schedule. They don't require public comment because we're compelling them as regular meetings. That way you just don't have to pull, and if a quorum doesn't show up, it doesn't show up. Okay. And the minutes can just be the minutes of the finance committee. Great. So I just one more thing to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also, that, that by the way, allows you as a member of the council, but not a member of the finance committee, to be just as interactive with the presentations. Andy. Yeah, the other thing that I just wanted to uh, remind you of, because uh, in case you aren't yet familiar with all the minutia about the uh, charter provisions on the budget is that the public forum is to be called by the president. The hearings are to be, are, are a requirement of the finance committee. Right. And um, so you see the dates of the hearings on the schedule. Uh, and uh, because we just voted to separately consider the regional school budget, there's actually a requirement that we have a second hearing regarding the regional school budget and uh, we are cognizant of the fact that the school committee itself is also required to have a hearing on the budget, but uh, the charter mandates that we take that action, and that's why it's listed. And Andy, the one on April 2nd is called by the Finance Committee as well, correct? That's correct. There's okay. The one on April 2nd is, re is required by the charter to be called by the finance committee, and um, the also the one, one on May twenty first, yes, which is regarding the other portions of the budget, okay. is under the same set of uh, requirements from the charter. Okay. Yes, Evan. Just looking for. I feel like all I'm doing tonight is looking for clarification. Um, all of this that's outlined here is completely separate from the capital improvement plan for which there's also a required public forum? Would we expect that we'll see something similar from JCPC to this? Yes. Okay. And yes, we do have to have that before the end of June as well. Okay. We're running as fast as we can. Um, are there any other questions on the budget? If not, I'm going to move on. Um, committee reports, let me just say, we'll have a committee report from, G, from GOL, Governance Organization and Legislation. We've already heard finance. We have a committee report from Outreach Communications and Appointments and Rules of Procedure. I have asked the um, person who is presently convening the bylaw review committee and I've not received any, 
any report from them, so we'll skip that. And on the Energy and Climate Action Ad Hoc Committee, we'll defer that till March 18th. So, um, GOL, Mandy Jo. So there's no written report this week. Um, we are meeting on Wednesday. Last week we also met, um, so I'll go through briefly what we did last week. There will be a full report written for it because there are some actions we're asking of the council. We adopted a template for the committee charges. We adopted a guidelines document for how will we, we will review bylaws, measures, charges, things like that for clear clarity, consistency, and actionability. Um, we decided to undertake a review of town committees for um, structure. It, it, I'm still not good at describing this as I look at Pat. Um, to, to see if there's any overlapping committees, if there's a way, if there's a need to consolidate any, to recommend dissolution of any, to create any. So we'll be taking a look at an economic development committee, things like that. Um, there is no timeline for that review at this point, uh, but I thought I'd let you guys know we're going to undertake that. And then we will have some requests to the town council at a meeting that I know next week, next meeting is very busy, so I'll work with our president to figure out when they'll show up on the agenda um, to recommend that we ask the town council to request that all town committees that were created at least five years ago review their charges, and if they seek changes, that they reformat their charges into the new template we just adopted, and then submit those revised charges to the town council to adopt or reject after review of the governance committee. So that will come with a bigger description of that at a future meeting when we have a report in writing. Um, at this week's meeting, we will be discussing the audit committee charge that was referred to us at last town council meeting, the community resources committee charge that was referred to us tonight, and the public ways recommendation memo that was referred to us at the last town council meeting, and if time allows, that organization and structure of town committees and a continued discussion by the committee of the GOL committee charge. Questions, Alyssa? I still don't understand why it's that committee's purview to have anything to do with any town committees that currently exist. I understand the point of having people review their charges regularly, although I will give the caveat that I'm fairly confident that not every committee that has a charge actually knows where their charge came from because the charge doesn't say on the charge and some of them are based on town meeting action and some are not, so hopefully they'll all have staff to help them with that. But that seems reasonable to me because that'll help the public to have a more consistent structure. But for GOL to be undertaking a review of town committees that have existed, that exist under mass general law to see if there's overlap, recommend dissolution, I'm not seeing that as part of the charge at all. So I'm concerned. I don't know why that has anything to do with town council. Why would we check the conservation commission's charge to see if it overlaps with a future economic development committee? What does that have to do with us? Other comment? I just, I, I just was pulling up the charge, and it's not part of the charge either. I mean, so I'm not sure why it's being done, but it also isn't something I think we asked to have done. Uh, at least I don't remember asking to have it done. Okay. Other comments? Shalini. Shalini. Did I hear um, the governance committee is working on the economic development committee? No. Did I hear that wrong? Mandy Joe. So my, uh, what I said was in undertaking a review of town committee charges that would potentially include looking at proposing an actual creation with a charge for an economic development committee. It could potentially include that. Other f questions, comments? Yes, Alyssa. So do I just keep saying that at every meeting or do we have a conversation about what the charge means? Because I don't want to fight, I just don't understand. And I don't want to just keep bringing it up randomly and having it continue okay. unless, are we changing the charge? Do we all agree? Do we not care? I mean, I, I just, I don't understand. <laughs> 
So the question that's been raised is whether or not the GOL committee, Governance Organization and Legislation Committee, has the, is within its purview based on its charge, the ability to look at all town committees and look at their charges and uh, ask for consistency. Is that? That part, I'm willing to concede. Okay. The whole speech about how, whether or not these committees should even exist because they have overlapping charges and <coughs> they might be, they might not need to exist, that, that whole part, no. That's the part I object to. Okay. George. I think we saw it as a kind of housekeeping task and eventually we'd come back to the council for uh, review and discussion. But if we don't do it, I mean, you could argue that don't, we don't care doesn't matter, just let it be. But if we do care and we do want to have someone systematically go through the existing committees and make sure that things are, so to speak, in order, it would seem to fall naturally to us, uh, but perhaps the charge doesn't allow it, fine. Uh, we certainly have enough to do. Um, we don't need any more extra work, but the question arises then, well, who does do it if you care to have it done? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, was, that was my question to you. If they don't do it, who is doing it? Who, you know, who is? So the question is, do we care to have it done, and if we do, who's doing it? Dorothy. Uh, my question is slightly different. I could see a good argument for doing what she described. However, I think it could be put off until we've done other things that are more pressing. Okay. Other comment, Evan. So just to uh, add some clarifications, I, this is not something that GOL is undertaking like in the next few months. This is part of what GOL has been doing is figuring out uh, who we are and, and, and what our role is um, and the different roles that we can play to serve the council. This was an idea that we generated as part of that discussion as perhaps a long-term goal of GOL. Uh, it's certainly not something that you'll see on an agenda in the very near future. Uh, I think that part of this has to do with how we might interpret um, the charge, and I think that the charge is, there's many ways you could read this, um, whether or not when we're talking about governance and organization, we are talking about strictly the governance and organization of the council, or whether we are thinking about that more broadly, um, that's, I think, something that we could debate in how we read the charge. I think I could make an argument to interpret the first bullet of our charge either way. Um, but I think one of the things that we realized um, is we have a lot of committees in this town, and we have a lot of vacancies. And the question is, do we still need all of those committees? And as, as one of our, uh, our committee members said, perhaps we need to Marie Kondo our committees. Um, and, and so then the question becomes, right, who does that? And, and it, it, if any committee, it seems to fall within the purview of GOL. If the council as a whole disagrees, that's the council. Steve? So any counselor can propose a project or a policy change or a, a bylaw. Um, any citizen can, you know, following a process can also propose additions, eliminations of, of committees. Um, I hope that we don't ad hoc committee everything. So I think that this is a really important project. The, the, the cleaning up and the strengthening of the committees of this town totally understand that some committees, in order to be a town, you must have a planning board, you must have a conservation commission, you must have a zoning board of appeals, you must have this, you must have, the other ones are dictated by the charter, other ones were dictated by town meeting. I think we have enough institutional knowledge to wade through that. I think this project needs to be done. The GOL is of, the one committee I'm on is the one where this suggestion has come up. So if it requires a change to the charge of the GOL, Let's go for it, but I don't think that we should squash ideas that need to happen because it's not explicitly anticipated in any of our charges. I'm, okay, um, I'm going to suggest the following, that we not continue this con conversation until such time as we have the charge of the committee before us, and if the committee would like to, if the GOL would like to propose a change 
or an amendment or some modification of its charge, it does so at that time. And I welcome that at any point in time, okay? Because we don't even have the charge in front of us at this time, okay? And I, by the way, think that that is probably something each of the standing committees may have to do from time to time, okay? Um, is there any other, uh, so we're going to move on to outreach communications and appointments. Sarah? We don't, we don't actually have anything written that we submitted to you. Um, I will tell you that we have met every Monday for I think seven weeks. Um, and the biggest thing that we've worked on so far is a procedure for appointments, mostly um, the decision tree, which big word we've been using a lot, um, has been for town council appointments. Um, and this sounds like it might be an easy thing to do, it just says that we do it, but I can tell you it's extremely complex. We cannot use um, the same um, process for appointments that Select Board did for many reasons, one of which is um, that we're a legislative branch and not an executive branch amongst other things. Um, we are wrestling with um, a process that would, all, would protect the privacy of, of people who are um, asking to be on committees and volunteer position. Um, as well as making sure that whatever process we use is as transparent as it can be so that members of the public feel like they know how we are deciding on the people that we are nominating and then w why we're nominating them. This has taken seven weeks of intense conversation of uh, many decision trees and also um, a lot of legal advice. Um, we have gone through many iterations of decision trees. And this particular one also is not just for town council appointments, but it will also link back into, there are certain things that we need, it's put forth in the charter that we'll need to confirm. So don't worry, we got it all under control. <laughs> um, we, we had a meeting today in which I'm fairly certain that we um, have narrowed down all of the questions that we need to ask for possible decision trees, um, legal questions that would, it's the last step we think, that need to be answered so that by the time that we meet, we're taking one Monday off, we will meet on March 18th, we should be able to say, vote and say this is our process and we can stand behind it philosophically, we can stand behind it, it's, it's so lawful, it's crazy. Like we have asked the attorney generals, we've asked the, you know, um, we've asked our town attorney. So we should be able to do that for you. Um, at our meeting today, we also talked about the fact that we have had so much discussion around appointments that the outreach part of our program sort of had fallen away. We wanna make sure that we just keep running full tilt on that. So we actually created a subcommittee of our subcommittee and we have we formed it, we have members, we will be meeting Monday the 18th right after our um, OCA meeting. So we really take outreach very seriously. We take outreach in how we coordinate it with um, the community participation officers and the resident advisory committee. So we're definitely uh, right on that. We're also gonna be talking a little bit more about the um, CAF forms and um, we're also looking into possibly um, some ways in order to have somebody else take our minutes. Um, one of the things that we was brought up to us today is maybe it could be a senior tax credit sort of thing and so we're on that as well. So, you know, the senior tax credits that they do, that perhaps that, that might be something that would be a possibility that taking minutes could be, we, I don't know that. I haven't even asked that, so don't. It was just a, it was just a workshop idea. So anybody out there who, who's saying, what? <laughs> yeah, we haven't even asked yet, but I, um, we're, we're working really hard and we hope that we'll have a lot of concrete things for you by our March 18th meeting. Okay. Any other questions on that? The, okay, let me just elaborate on that. Evan? 
I just wanted to piggyback on what Sarah said uh, to stress the uh, amount of work we've done to make sure that everything we do complies with open meeting law. Of our two and a half hour meeting today, a full hour and a half of it was spent on speakerphone with town attorney, just making sure that we're checking all of our boxes so you can be confident that we are making sure we're coming forth with as solid a process as possible legally. Okay. Any further comment from the committee? Questions? Um, rules of procedure ad hoc. We meet tomorrow. We'll do the stuff you referred to us, plus all that other stuff. It'll be great. <laughs> the only thing I ask of this committee is if there are things that perhaps should be instead referred to GOL that you let us know. Okay. I would just follow up on that by saying GOL is going to get all the leftovers. So what we don't get done is going to be their problem. So, um, but I don't see us carving anything off at this point. But there may be sections we say to be discussed in the future. Okay. Given the fact that your committee has a deadline of June 3rd. Um, all right. Anything else on committees? We have no minutes to approve. We've done proclamations. Town manager's report. Paul, some highlights. Yes. Um, first, you already mentioned the events on March 2nd, which went off uh, very well from our perspective. There were um, six arrests, but that's a relatively a average weekend for us. Um, a number of transports per usual. Um, but again, want to thank publicly the, our mutual aid partners. Uh, terrific planning by the police department, fire department, UMass police department, and, and the university. So uh, a very good day. And as we were, we, on that day, we run two emergency operations centers, one at the university, one in, at our police station. And as we closed our emergency operations center um, at around 5.30, um, we received a notice of um, sudden loss of pressure in our water system. And, that, and this is something that you all heard. I hope you all received a phone call or a text or both or email something. Uh, if, you're, if you didn't, you should be signed up for our emergency notification system. Um, so this happened on Saturday night. Uh, this, uh, usually when something like this happens, it means there's a fire or a uh, water main break because you see a, a loss of pressure. It means our water tank is, is dropping the, the amount of water that's in it. Um, <clears throat> The on-call water people were, came into town. Uh, they didn't see wa any water main break, or there was, we knew there wasn't a fire. Um, they brought additional supervisors in, and then they identified the, pro the problem as being at well number three. We have five wells, if you recall from your orientation with the Department of Public Works, that we have five wells plus two surface treatment, uh, two surface water areas. Um, so one of the wells was pumping, so all the indicators were saying everything's working normally, except that we're losing water. And no one could figure, figure it out on just looking at the equipment because all of the pumps were pumping regularly. But what was happening is that one of the wells was pumping water not into the system, but out of the system. <laughs> and it had an overflow valve that popped open and that created a problem. I'm using my language, this is not what the engineers would say. Um, <laughs> So they quickly shut down that well, um, and it was isolated from the system. This greatly re reduced the loss of water from the system. We, turned, we brought a couple more water operators in. We turned on our fifth well, and that started operating. And we continued to ask people to conserve um, water. So that was all done with about, within about an hour, and by 8.30, uh, we were notifying people around 6.30. By 8.30, uh, we felt we had it under control, but the water had already gone out of the system, so it took time to recover. Fortunately, it was a Sunday. There's, it's a typically a low water use day, and, um, and that has been built up, and it's back to normal now. The pump that had um, broken has been fixed, so everything's back to normal. And uh, so, but again, thanks to uh, DPW, Amy Rosecki, and Guilford Mooring, and all the water treat, all the water 
guys um, who came in to help uh, identify the problem and fix it. Thanks to our communications team, uh, Dave Zomag, Julie Fetterman, Brianna Sunrid, who were out trying to maintain good communication. We did a lot of outreach to the university and the two colleges because of our, my last, when I first started here, we had an experience with a drought that was, that we had to work really hard to make sure the communication worked well. So everybody did a terrific, I, terrific job and that day was over. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so a few other things. Um, uh, We've had some snow emergencies, as you've seen. We had one last night. And I want to make sure people understand, we get calls about saying, how am I supposed to know if there's a snow emergency? You know, I know you have these blue lights, but if I'm not out of bed, how am I supposed to know? Um, and so you can sign up for emergency notifications through email or text. You can always go to our website. We send it out to the press and to all the media so it will scroll on the screen. Um, there is the flashing lights, and we put it in multiple places on our website. So, but the basic rule rule would be to, if it's going to snow, expect that you're going to have to move your car, and just assume that if it snows, you're going to have to move your car. And that's the message we want the public to hear, because we don't like towing cars, we don't like ticketing cars. But if they're in the way of the DPW plows. We have to do that, otherwise it leaves a giant mess and creates hazards for public safety vehicles and for the general public. Um, just a few other things. Um, we'll be doing a cup of joe thing on March 15th from 7.30 to 9 in the morning at Atkins um, in uh, South Amherst. And my guest that day will be Chief Tim Nelson. Our CPOs have been uh, hard at work, continuing to work. One uh, attended a very successful um, meeting on Sunday that George and Dorothy put on and um, was very happy to have been there. And we're trying, to, they're anxious to have a conversation with um, the OCA committee to, to help develop a really good model for um, district meetings so we can support the district meetings in a, in a um, sustainable, sustainable way. Um, and we want our staff to be able to attend the district meetings, um, but we want to do it in a manageable way. And uh, George had actually suggested some had some ideas on how we could do that successfully. So I think there's a real opportunity here to gauge um, how we handle staff attendance at your district meetings um, and think it through so that uh, anytime you say, oh, I'd like this at my district meeting, we have to multiply that by five districts times twice a year and we want to help, but it would be helpful for the council to say, here's what we expect the standards to be. Um, what I tell people is that my time is elastic, so anytime you invite me to anything, if I can do it, I absolutely will be there. Our department heads have a fair amount of elasticity in their time, too. They, they have higher expectations. Our line staff, I'm very protective of their weekends because um, if you say, oh, it's only an hour, it's actually four hours and it sort of hangs over them for the weekend. And I, I don't like asking them to do that unless we have to. I'm, if it's important, we will always do that. But we just like to set the expectations for our staff and make sure that it's in alignment with what is serving your constituents, which I knew you wanted to provide really good services to your constituents, which I think you've been doing in a really well, good way. Um, Many of you may not know about our Kanagasaki Sister City program, so that delegation from Japan will be coming uh, at the end of March, March 24th. There's typically a reception, uh, it's just a welcome ceremony, it's not even reception, I can't even call it that. Uh, in this room, when they come in, they bring their suitcases in, there's a few, um, the council president will be on vacation, so we'll ask the vice president of the council to say a few words um, of welcome to them. There's some people from the schools who will speak, and then they speak, and then they get off to their hosts, uh, to their hosts' homes. Um, and so they're only here until Sunday, and Andy is much more familiar with the, with the group. He's been doing it for a number of years and ha actually has traveled to Japan. So he may want to add more to that. Um, our HR director, I think you've all met, Evelyn Rivera Riffenberg started today, and she's come in and is meeting with all department heads and lots of staff. <laughs> In my report, I mentioned uh, the town of Leverett seeking to have an extension of their water, of the town of Amherst water in line into the town of Leverett. 
This is an issue that's been going on for over a decade, where some of homes, a half, half, roughly about a half a dozen homes in Leverett had their wells contaminated uh, purportedly from the um, landfill in Leverett. So they're looking at different ways to fix the problem. They've been buying these homes wa bottled water for a long time. And so they're looking at different options. One of the options is to extend our water line on East Leverett Road into Leverett. Uh, that would, if, they, if that were to come to fruition, if that's, that's, for that to be considered, the council would need to approve it, both because you are the water and sewer commissioners and you're the keeper of the public way, and you have to approve intermunicipal agreements. So you've got three shots at this, and you can say, and they would need to have yes, yes, yes for this to happen. They're not sure, I talked with um, one, of the one of the select board members from Leverett on Sunday, they're still not sure what direction they're going in. To, in. They're hoping to get some resolution in the town of Leverett at their annual meeting this um, May. But uh, again, just not, they're looking at different options um, in terms of potentially taking the houses or whatever op other options they're exploring. What our posture has been is that we've been working with them with um, out incurring costs to the town of Amherst, but providing them any technical advice or engineering advice that we can offer them. They've engaged an engineering firm to start to investigate how much it would cost them and what, what the barriers are to extending our water line. Um, you might say, well, wait a minute, do we have enough water to give them? From DPW's point of view, six houses is kind of minuscule compared to a lot of other things that are proposed in town. So. It, and if we can, with the agreement, we can limit it to the number of houses who would make connections. Um, Station Road Bridge, um, we've received comments back from the State Department of Transportation. Um, they had some uh, minor things that they've identified. They had a couple more substantive things. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow, I'm not, but there is a meeting tomorrow with our engineers uh, to review all of the changes that they have requested and that project, we're going to keep moving it forward um, and hope that we still have our schedule. I will know more after tomorrow's meeting as to whether we can stay on schedule or not. And that is my report. Okay. Great. Thank you. Questions? Mandy Jo. I have one about Station Road and one about Groff Park, which you didn't mention. I'll start with Station Road. So. It, my understanding is the bid documents have not gone out then, so we still think we can meet the April 17th deadline. Um, it seems implausible to me, but um, I'm, I'm not an engineer. Right. Uh, so they're exploring other means of um, securing the bridge, and um, that might tighten up the schedule a little bit. So. And Groff Park, yay, is what I'm, one thing I want to say is I'm thrilled to see that bids came in and they're within the budget. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what the plan for Mill Lane is when Groff Park has a brand new playground and splash park with Mill Lane currently right now as bad of a moonscape as I've ever seen it in the last five months, that it's practically undrivable and will swallow your car. And to put a new playground and water park in there and keep a road, an access road, undrivable for two large developments that live on the other side of that road, what's our plan for making that accessible without ruining cars? So we will be bringing um, or uh, sending to you a um, pavement plan uh, for the, in a with relatively short period of time. And um, I don't know where Mill Lane is on that. Typically what we have been doing with our, our pavement money, which is we know we have a lot of needs and um, not enough money to meet all those needs. and that. Um, Mill Lane is not one of those that gets the, the highest priority because we try to fix the roads that are already um, in bad shape. So, it's in horrible shape. <laughs> yes, but it's unpaved and people know it's unpaved. Kathy. Um, I just, Paul knows, I, I sent him this question, I'll, I'll 
among others. So as we have road plans, um, there is a hierarchy of uh, what we think we're doing when and where. Um, is there a point at which uh, people would be able to see it? Um, and then the other question related to that, in this past year or the current year, where you made a big effort to put more money into roads, uh, did that come with, if we spend $900,000, we get this far over the course of a year, so you have a kind of a standard that we'll get this many miles done, or, you know, so you can look backwards and say, did we do it? And you can look forward and say, what are we thinking of doing? Sure. Um, Yes, and it's not an exact science, as you can imagine, because when you go out to bid and it's a competitive world, you, you may get fewer than you anticipate. What, this, what the plan does is estimates how, much, how many roads we can pave, puts that on a calendar, and, and sort of over five years, and we can start to look at that. And, um, but it moves like any plan. It's a budget. It's a forecast, but it, it's not like you're locked in place. There might be a road that blows up during the winter, and we have to pri reprioritize that. But at least people can see where am I generally over that five-year plan, and that's a um, by road, by by location. Are there other questions? Yes, Mark Darcy. I don't have a question, just a comment. Um, uh, I know this wasn't in your report, but I um, attended the municipal vulnerability preparedness workshop today, and I'm going tomorrow. And just wanted to say that it seemed like incredibly well run, effective. It was very exciting to see all the different town staff and um, sustainability uh, people that were from the different institutions like UMass and Amherst College and some of them I was meeting for the first time today. Um, but just wanted to commend you for um, that fantastic uh, process that's going forward. I'll say thank you, but it's because I had nothing to do with it. It was all, <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Ciccarello was really the owner of that and made that happen. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. So I wanted to say, as someone who's been a resident of Meadow Street for 30 years, I just want to say kudos to everyone who planned fabulous things for UMass students to attend that they were excited about. I will tell you that usually we sit on the front porch and watch the parade. This is happy, happy students and the quietest on Meadow Street that I've seen in 30 years, so amazing. Um, the other thing I wanted to say as um, chair of OCA is that um, we have had the privilege to work with town staff quite a bit in these past seven weeks. And I'm so impressed by them, and I'm so appreciative of everything they've done to support us. So most definitely, we will. I will invite um, the community participation officers to come. To, I'll just give them some ideas for meetings, um, and we really look forward to having them with us. Thank you. And on, in terms of Meadow Street, one of the things that the uh, police reported was that the biggest challenge they had on in North Amherst was the police officers was boredom because there wasn't anything going on. And at one point, um, yeah, so that was the issue. I want to echo, yeah, I mean, it was so quiet. It was kind of creepy. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Alyssa. I wanted to say something about RAC based on a conversation I had with the town manager earlier this evening since we got to meet the RAC members, which was great. Thank you for bringing them in. And I'm glad two of the three could make the time and hopefully we'll get to meet Ms. Dennis soon is that just from an OCA point of view, one of the things we wanted to be able to eventually explain to you when we brought forward candidates to be appointed to various things, that we wanted to be able to explain where the RAC fit into the process. And it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it has been determined that the RAC will not be seeing individual applications from applicants and so they will not be serving in that way to evaluate and select. They will not be looking at names of people. And they will be um, subject to open meeting law. So they will have posted meetings where they, can, where they talk about things that they said they were going to talk about tonight. So just so that you're remembering that, so that when we bring you that whole long process of what we used, that's where they're fitting into it as we understand it right now. Paul? Yes. Yeah, so the pr presumption is that they Residents Advisory Committee is a public body, is subject to the open meeting law. Um, 
again, I've had individual conversations with the three, but they have not met as a committee yet. And so one of the conversations to have with them is how they can best help with the process. And part of that might be uh, individually being involved in, in interviewing people, because that's something that is, is, an, is available. It could uh, be consulting with me. Um, and also holding me accountable to um, standards that the charter has put in about diversity and qualifications. And so they can hold on to those and review those as well. So there's, a, as I said earlier, I think it's a work in progress. I think we're really privileged to have really quality people. Um, on the, Both you met the Board of License Commissioners at four of the five, and they're all really um, uh, very talented people. But more than that, a lot have not been involved in town government before, which is unusual typically for a lot of um, our, our um, volunteers. And it's kind of exciting because they have a lot of energy. They're coming in. They're excited by the new form of government and want to be involved. And so, again, the Residence Advisory Committee, I'm anxious to have a conversation with the three of them as a group and see how, how they perceive the, their role as well. Okay. Further questions, comments? Okay. Um, we um, are moving on to town council comments, and we have two items that we have sent, that I sent out to you. One was the draft goals of the council, and the other was with the draft value statement. Um, I, along with the draft goals in your packet tonight, there was also a direct transcript of the um, the butcher paper, the, the notes that we took during the, um, uh, our retreat. And then my first, and I do mean first, and very draft uh, attempt to try to turn those goals into some kind of plan, if you will, statement of goals and then plan. Uh, I did receive comments, but only from three counselors. And so I really don't know that we have a lot that we can do with that sitting here tonight, besides the fact that we would be wordsmithing and that doesn't seem very useful. On the value statement, Shalini, I'm gonna leave you to talk about that at this time. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share this document. I'm kind of excited about it, and it's something we've all been working on. It's the values that we discussed at three different, at least two different points of time. One was uh, our first workshop with Stan Rosenberg, and where we shared some do's and don'ts that we want to see happen in our town council. And the second was the retreat. And then I also looked at the document um, um, the charter commission's values, what, what did they value? And so I kind of looked at these three documents and then I looked at several other towns of uh, the value statements that they have and put together, um, combined all of this. And the purpose of doing this um, is really to create a shared vision of what's most important to us as a town and as a town council. Um, and so it sets the guidelines for how we run our meetings and um, how we interact with each other and, uh, and kind of set the tone for the culture in town as well. Um, so that's kind of the main purpose of creating a document like this. And so a couple of reasons why, it, um, in addition that I think there, it's important to have a document like this is uh, you know, when we're running our meetings or making decisions that we all have a shared set of values and they're not competing or um, inconsistent with each other. For example, you know, if uh, we have fiscal responsibility as a value, as a town council, but fiscal responsibility can mean different things to different people. So just having a common, um, a collective vision of what that looks like um, so we, and, and so just, so that's one reason. The other is it would set the tone for our meetings and district meetings as well, like we talked about um, uh, balance being, for example, one of the things that has come up, you know, as we're respecting the boundaries of the town staff, but I think the same applies to all of us. 
Um, you know, so I put, I stuck in that value, and it was sort of mentioned in the retreat, the idea of balance. Um, but I think it's important for us to be sustainable in the long run and to make good decisions that if it's not important, uh, we should not meet on weekends, for example. You know, so things like this could then create the boundaries or where we feel we're at crossroads then we, can, you know, the, this document can provide us guidance that are we indeed true to the the values that we um, put 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 together. So we could the different ways we can use it, and all of this is open to, of course, uh, um, discussion. And so I invite everyone to um, share their. Uh, I mean, I don't know how we want to proceed with this, but I think what what would be helpful is to see what values or what guidelines would help all of us feel uh, safe, would help, help us feel productive in our meetings. And so we can then include those and also think of how we are running our district meetings because I think the same guidelines would also be helpful in, in running our meetings. I think that's about it. So, uh, here are here are the options. Mm. One is we could sit here and we could discuss the goals. We could also discuss the value statement. Another option is we, in fact, do create an ad hoc committee to work on these and bring them back. Uh, and those are really the two options as I mm. see it. This could be part of the rules committee because we are already writing the rules and I was actually sort of in charge of um, making sure that, I mean, sort of having sort of uh, an, op an introductory statement in the rules document that these are the values which are guiding us in how we are writing the rules. That would be for the values part of it. Yeah. My only hesitation is how much more can the rules committee take on and meet their deadline? Alyssa. We were already doing this section. So if you values. hadn't brought it forward now, we would have been doing it in time for June 3rd. Okay. This was one of our sections. The, the one thing I, I do want to mention associated with that, though, is that if people have input, obviously, I think the best thing to do is for them to write directly to Shalini, and then we will, we will take that into account, because we have not had a chance to discuss this topic yet at Rules. And of course, we keep adding things to our agenda, as you indicated. Um, I will say, just in terms of, for example, um, I'm hesitant to say this because obviously it's a public meeting, but under integrity it says avoidance of big money politics. That just clangs really hard to me against all the other things we're saying, and so maybe what we're talking about, for example, is a perception that we're influenced by big money politics, for example. And the whole balance thing, obviously, I much prefer imbalance, and so clearly I don't agree with any of those statements. <laughs> but everything else I really like. And so um, I'm hoping that rule, I, I, what I'm perceiving is that rules would not bring this back to you necessarily immediately, although we could, um, just as we've brought some other trial sorts of things to do. If we can make significant progress on this, say on Wednesday, after we do the other two priorities we have to do that you referred to us. But we had always intended this was gonna be kind of the preface to our rules document. Okay, so the, the idea then in this case is this would just, people first of all would provide Shalini individually, not in group, any feedback on the town values and guidelines, and that would then be incorporated into the Rules of Procedure Committee. Is there any further discussion about that piece? That does not require a motion. Okay? All right, on the goals, I personally feel that I need some additional assistance on this. Uh, I would I could continue to do that by having you comment to me individually, or I could do that by having a very small working group, otherwise known as an ad hoc committee. And the reason I, this is important is because these need to be meshed then with the goals set by the select board and put together as it relates to the evaluation of the annual review of the town manager all of which has to take place and be completed by the 
uh, month of August. So, um, yes. Just a, a question. What, uh, what will be the final product here and where will it reside? I mean, what is... The, in, interesting, I'm taking a, play, a, a page out of the select book in the past, select board in the past. So they would establish goals, Andy and Alyssa, and for, of the select board. And then those would be in, incorporated into the town manager's goals. Now, interestingly, the town manager has performed his duties for essentially five months under the select board, but seven months under us. But the question is, based on what goals? And at some point, you know, you have to evaluate someone against something. So it would be a public document. And, it, and then the other piece that I find important about goals, it's a measure of us. It's our statement to the community. This is what we plan to accomplish this year and whether we accomplish it or not. So I see two purposes and I see it as a very public statement. Alyssa. If I could just clarify a little bit about the select board's practice. So um, the select board was part of the executive. The select board did not have its own separate goals. Mm, the select right. board had goals for the town manager to accomplish because he was Thank the one you. who could implement the things that we wanted to have done. He is working under the select board goals. We can't just change him to the town council right. goals next week <laughs> because right. he's been working under those goals all this time. But we need to be thinking this through so that I mean, right now, the evaluation document would be based on the goals that were established for him in the fall. Um, but you want to have the next document ready. And if you do want separate, since you're talking about now about two separate branches, you do want to have two separate sets of goals, then obviously, as you say, they need to mesh. That's, all, that, that's critically important. But there, was not, there were not two separate sets of goals in the past. They were purely goals for the town manager, and those goals were put on a chart, which you can read, at your leisure um, on the old select board page as to how we evaluated those goals. Thank you. Yes, George. What I'm hearing if correctly, I think, from you is that um, if we just sent you comments, some of us have done that, some of us haven't, that still kind of leaves the burden on you. you it's what I'm hearing is you might like some help with this, so an ad hoc mm -hmm. committee would be very useful to you personally in working through this. Is, am I hearing that correctly? or Yes, not? you are. Okay. That's, then I would think that would be a good way to go. Okay. And it, to do that formally would be to form an ad hoc committee. So you're making a motion. a motion to form an ad hoc committee uh, to assist you in the, in the formation of these goals. And uh, yes. Is there a second? Sarah, further discussion? How Maybe many members? Maximum five unless you want to have committees of the whole. Okay. Any further conversation on that? All those in favor of the motion? Thank you, it's unanimous. Now I want to see who, the people who would like to work with me on this. Raise your hands. Sarah, Evan. Okay, I got more than I need. Unless it's a committee of six. Keep your hand up, Sarah. It can be, it can be a committee of six. One, because I'm, I'm one of them. Okay, so it's Sarah. Six is a scheduling nightmare. Okay, Sarah, <laughs> Kathy, George, and Pat, and myself. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. That does not mean that we don't welcome the comments from all the rest of you. We do want them, okay? Please provide those to me directly and individually. Any further conversations on either of those? I ask that group to stay so we can see if we can find a time to meet in the very near future. Um, future agenda items. We are trying our very best to get as much information out to you today. Um, you did see the uh, very aggressive calendar for both the regional school budget and the regular budget, so that, that gives you a sense of what's coming up. 
But in addition to that, on March 18th, we will be hearing from the schools, from the elementary schools, on the MSBA application uh, to, for the statement of interest. And we will also be uh, looking at the East Street School Affordable Housing Project. We will probably then, on April 1st, do both of those again. And the reason being is that the first is when we will take the vote for the MSBA. It is unclear whether we'll be ready to take the vote on the East Street School Affordable Housing, but since it involves the transfer of land, we need to have it come before us twice before we vote on it. Okay? And then I want to ask for additional items, and I'm going to start by adding one, for which I'm going to ask Councillor Brewer, Alyssa, to be part of helping us be educated on the issue of marijuana mm -hmm. and how it relates to the town of Amherst. Yeah, June, maybe May. Are there other issues? Yes, Kathy. Okay, and, and I wasn't sure when we would want to do this, but at the very beginning we talked about this reforming committees, what are we doing? And then there was an issue of liaisons with others. We talked about that last week. We referred the issue of liaisons to the so topics for tomorrow for tomorrow night. Okay. Okay, and then that would be come back then. That would come back with a recommendation, and then we'll deal with liaisons. Okay, and then the second one is this um, discussion we had tonight about bus routes and transportation. I just what I'd like to know, and maybe it'll come up in um, finance is where and how bus routes, paying money, decisions get made. So I, I understood we're gonna get more information back, but I think we were, we were being presented with something that if we don't act soon, the opportunity to act won't be there. And I just don't quite understand what the implications okay. are. So maybe we can bring, do that first in finance if it's a money issue. So just not quite grappling how we do okay. it, since we so don't really have a transportation subcommittee or, you know, a liaison, and TAC doesn't deal with, I ask, they don't usually deal with bus routes, you know, they, you know, so the transportation advisory, so just trying to figure out right. where. So, um, first of all, Mr. Slaughter, Doug Slaughter has agreed to look into the proposal that um, Bob Kuzner brought forward, Rob Kuzner, and I will take it up with the town manager and with Paul, with Doug to determine how we bring that back. It does also have a question that then blends into our budget, which we can discuss how that happens in finance committee. Yep. Any further question on that, Paul? Okay. Other issues before the council that you would like to have come before the council? Yes, Darcy. Uh, one issue that I think has come up um, recently, and uh, I think that we, uh, at least I overlooked as we were um, approving different of our uh, charges for committees of the council, uh, was just the issue of whether or not the, the new committees have the ability to, to um, decide matters on their own, decide policy as opposed to coming back to the council with recommendations for action, for action items. So I would really appreciate kind of revisiting uh, some of the committee, committee charges just to, um, to see if they have that ability, um, especially the GOL committee and we talked about it today in OCA also. Um, and so uh, that just is really important to me. I feel like there are issues that um, uh, I would like to be involved in the decision making on. I think my constituents have, you know, they elected me to have a voice in some of these major uh, policy decisions that we're making now. Um, and I would like to see a lot of those decisions made on the council level as opposed to in the 
committees of the town council. I think it's you know great that that those committees are able to do all the work to 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 be able to present a recommendation to the council, but I think all of us should be able to be involved in the decision making in a lot of these issues. Um, so I would kind of like to see that as an agenda item. So it's really looking at our standing committees, their role, their charges, their role, and their at what point they bring what forward to the council. Right. Fine. I'm I'm totally hearing that. Yes, Sarah. So I, I totally understand that, and I, I do agree with that on the whole. I guess one thing that Oka was struggling with is, you know, when you, when a, maybe we could look at what information the town council as a whole would like to see when a committee brings their decision in front of all of us. Just in the fact that, so that um, we're answering pertinent questions and that, of course, if the town council says, I, I think this is terrible, you've got to go back, at least they, we, can, we can have a format of a very, answering very succinct questions so that we're not then going back and debating something that the, that the particular committees have already gone through. So let me just state one very clear thing. All standing committees only bring forward recommendations to the council. They don't bring forward decisions. It's the council's prerogative to vote and decide. So I happened to be at the meeting where this came up earlier today, and it was around the issue that this group has spent enormous amount of effort on, which is the issue of how to go about selecting people to be recommended for committees. And I, it's leading to a body of practice that this committee will be putting into place. But I personally feel it's important for the council to understand what that practice looks like. Because at times, there may be other bodies or other collections of the council that will have to follow similar practice. So, but we can discuss that as this whole agenda item. I do ask each of the standing committees, of which there are only at this point three, to look at your charges and see if there's any other tweaking on your charges. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, I think I, I hear what Darcy's saying. And so one of the things I was gonna say is a lot of, <clears throat> at least in terms of the two committees I serve on, OCA and GOL, we're still sort of figuring out our footing um, and, and how we operate and to some extent who we are. And so uh, perhaps this is a bigger discussion that the council should have in July after, because the, the budget's gonna consume us for the next two months, right? But also that will have given us six months as committees to sort of get our bearings, figure out who we are, and then we can sort of have a discussion of the council of, are these committees operating the way we intended them to when we created them in, December, um, do the committees feel like they have what they need to operate and maybe that's a time for committees to bring forth um, proposals. It seems like it'd be good to have it as like a holistic discussion of the council of, all right, is we set the structure up, it's been seven months, how, how's it going? Um, mm -hmm. But also recognizing that the next few months are very busy and committees are still figuring out themselves and so we right. should have, we need to let the, them mature first before we kind of reevaluate. There may be some things that we want to bring up earlier than right. that, but Darcy? I would just say that um, I feel like right now is the time when we're making these major decisions um, in all the different committees and we're making the, the big policy, hopefully recommendations about uh, how we're going to work as a council. Um, so I, I actually would disagree with Evan on that because mm -hmm. I think that time is of the essence. We, we need to be looking at what we're doing right now um, because this is when all the big decisions are being made. They'll all be made by July. Um, I, A lot of them. I hear that and we'll take it under consideration when we look as when to put this on the agenda. It may be a two-staged conversation. 
one that says, are there some tweaking now, and another one down the road that says, what else do we need to do? Somebody's decided the light should go out. Okay, that's a hint. Is there any other, any other issues, additional agenda items, et cetera? I noticed we didn't take a poll tonight. I know. I know. I, it, <laughs> all right. There are no other topics. Are there any other counselor comments at this time? I just have Darcy. One more. Um, I just wanted to say that I, you know, I was going to make a comment about transparency and problems with it, but I, I've been very pleased to find out that um, uh, uh, the different committees are going to be meeting in this room. And yes. um, the president informed me, or the OCA committee today, that there's going to be some kind of provision for automatic videotaping in here. So that's a stride forward. We're working on it. <laughs> Still working the kinks out, but getting there. Yes. By the way, there are other groups that like to meet here, but we have priority. Okay. <laughs> or so I'm told. Um, any other questions or comments from the counselor? I don't have any topics that were not anticipated. I'm sure there's many, but I'm not going to bring them up. No executive session? Yes. Uh, today, I attended the hearing in this room of the Fort River uh, School Committee, and I was the Fort only River. council member, and I was one of two people who weren't part of the committee. It was interesting, and I did learn something, because for me, when I see a picture, and I don't always understand what they're saying, they explained it, and I learned a lot. This is for the Fort River um, feasibility. Feasibility. Thank you. Okay. That yes, there were children in attendance. Yes. So there were more than two. <laughs> There were more than two, it's just that they weren't of voting age. <laughs> okay. All right. Are there any other comments, observations? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Second, Pat. All those in favor? Thank you.